Okay, seeing it's past 10 o'clock hour, uh, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Del Norte and the governing body of all other special assessment and taxing districts for which said board so acts is now meeting a regular session. Only those items that indicate a, spe a specific time will be heard at the assigned time. All other items may be taken out of sequence to accommodate the public and staff availability. And we will, Supervisor, uh, uh, Supervisor Sullivan will lead. Go ahead and lead the plan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. That looks like we left that part out. Uh, any introduction of new employees? Okay. Seeing no introduction, uh, uh, any action from closed session? Nothing today. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to the agenda at this time? In order to add an item to the agenda, the matter must have come to the attention of the county subsequent to the posting of the agenda, and the matter requires action before the next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I'm going to throw something out there. Uh, Jay, did you receive an email from John Thompson as to resigning from the RDA oversight? Okay. Well, then I guess we can't take action. He's going to be resigning. The board's going to need to approve somebody else. And the next meeting is Wednesday, so it'll just be left on staff for that meeting. Okay. The, it's this coming Wednesday? Yeah. So will John be able to sit in that room? No, John will be in Florida. But he was supposed to send an email of resignation to where the board needs to appoint somebody. So be thinking about who you want for our next meeting. Well, we could bring it up during your verbal report, right? You sure, certainly may. <laughs> okay. Um, at this point, uh, we'll now hear brief reports and announcements from board members uh, related to programs, projects, travels, and committees. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Supervisor Finnegan. Sure, I'll be brief. First, I uh, went to a meeting of the Regional Council of Rural Counties. Um, the legislative sausage, sausage making was <laughs> wrapping up, uh, and by that I mean they were taking bills, they would gut and amend, so something that had to do with water quality ended up having something to do with prisons. I mean, it just, there was no rhyme or reason, uh, and that whole process has to be changed. What affected us most, there was a couple of discussions regarding Prop 30 and Prop 31. One is the governor's initiative um, that has constitutional guarantees for the AB 109 fix and some of the, some of the programs are being pushed down to the county to make sure that the funding is gonna stay there. And then also there's gonna be uh, Prop 31 um, which uh, has to do with government performance and accountability. Um, the California Forward is doing that, so maybe before the election we'll get reports on those. What affected the county most was AB 885, as you know, was the septic regulations. Well, that finally was resolved. Uh, it took years. I think you've heard me reporting on that. Basically, what's going to happen is nothing to this county. Uh, the final water quality regs are not going to be implemented for three years and during that time most of the county is going to be asked to develop their own regulations. We as a county took a lead here a couple of years back and actually for septic tanks what was going to be required uh, for engineered systems and for regular systems and whatnot. So there's the bottom line is is there will be no change to this county the way that we um, uh, regulate our septic tanks. Good news. Um, yeah so that is good news. Um, the, had a meeting, uh, the CSAC officers call. One of the issues that we dealt with is we had a resignation of the executive director, and we are now in uh, going to be looking for a new executive director for the state association. I had a meeting down in, or uh, here rather, with all the agencies that were affected regarding mobile home parks and the Stockett issue down in Klamath. So it was our staff, mental health, uh, excuse me, social services. Um, environmental services, uh, you know, the sheriff, the state agencies, uh, the water boards, everybody was involved in the room at the same time, the Yurok tribe, uh, there was, uh, so everybody knew what the rules were and who had the responsibility to do what, and I think you read the newspaper that Mr. Stockett chose not to conform, and so the state has interceded, and he was subsequently arrested, and uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Bottom line is, is a lot of people stepped in, including the Yurok tribe and OES, and to make sure that uh, the people that were the residents down there, and John Alexander, you helped quite a bit on that too, made a couple of personal appearances uh, to make sure that they were being taken care of, a lot of elders down there and kids as well. 
had a meeting out in the Birch Track regarding what's going on out there, um, and basically uh, the, the community church out there sponsors a bunch of programs and they don't have any money, and they're looking for partners, and it was uh, just being apprised of uh, what programs, it's like a mini family resource center out there, and, and sort of giving direction to Millie and trying to find out how to sustain some of those programs. Uh, an area of need, it's an area that we paid attention to with the park out there and propped up with some of our programs uh, and um, they need some help. Had uh, attended the city county meeting. Uh, one of the things that um, came out of that was we got an off the wall uh, invitation to pass business licenses that we subsequently questioned why the city would ask us to invite us to do that. And then of course, uh, didn't really hit me until I got home that the uh, mayor thought that maybe I wasn't informing you properly about what's been going on with redevelopment agency. So you're going to get a report on that a little later in the meeting. Um, something that's going to be uh, maybe they should have been careful what they asked for. Um, then I also had the opportunity to go down to Klamath to look at uh, with our department and with Caltrans and property owners down there regarding the Hunter Creek Bridge and the new realignment or new bridge project that's going to take place there and got the opportunity to spend a lot of time with family, uh, visiting father and playing with kids. So that's about it. All right, thank you. Supervisor McClure. Thank you. Um, I participated in the RAC meeting, which is a, an accelerated project where we will be looking at about $230,000 in projects. And the next meeting when projects are due is the um, 10th, the closing date was the 20th. Fourth, yeah. for projects to be submitted and then on September 17th we will award those projects so it's a very accelerated process but I think that we will be able to successfully do that and we have three of our own road projects that we have submitted so that is happening the senior board met we had um, oversight from the state they were visiting and watching the the board in action and one of the things that we know is going to be problematic is that the budget, of course, is always slim. And we had um, hopes that the CDBG money would come forward for Redwood Cove, which needs a elevator repair replacement. And that was not awarded. So now we have to figure out how to assist Redwood Cove in, in getting the elevator into a condition because it's senior housing and they have to be able to get to their apartments. Um, EMS, we did a, a phone uh, meeting and everything is fairly the same there. They have been able to pull together a budget that will continue to have oversight of emergency medical services. Um, I also participated in two meetings with the monitoring team for the MLPA process. And that, I think, um, it was made very clear to the people who are doing the, um, the project that we want to see the, the request for proposals and that we want to make sure that people in our community are part of those monitoring proposals. Um, for instance, they, they may do a kelp bed analysis and that kelp bed analysis requires divers to actually go into the water and, and make an evaluation of the kelp beds. And we want to make sure that anybody here that is skilled to do that would be able to participate because it's a um, $4 million of monitoring money that's going to come into, the, into Humboldt, Del Norte, and Mendocino counties. And so Humboldt, Del Norte, and Mendocino County are kind of coming together as, as asking this monitoring team that we would like to see the same um, we would like to see the same approach that we used for the MLPA where we actually have people that are from our community that are part of the, um, the process instead of it happening through a group of, of very skilled people from San Francisco but it, we, we want to be, be at the table with a voice and we press that very hard that we want the county at the table and we want the tribes at the table. And I think they heard that message very clear. In fact, I have a template that I'll put on for the next agenda that we will actually send to um, Secretary Laird reiterating our position and what we need to do and that 
I'll get that to Jay and it'll be on the next agenda. I met with the healthcare district two by twos where we're still attempting to figure out what to do in relationship to the um, Sutter regionalization and um, the attorneys are on it. Hopefully it's going to work. Um, I did have the opportunity or the unfortunate opportunity to spend time at the hospital with a um, person who was in, 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 was in the hospital. And I can tell you that the service at the hospital is outstanding. And it was the acute nature of, of the um, person that really made me realize how important it is that we remain an acute care hospital. So um, the service is great. I don't think that Sutter is not a bad player. It's just Sutter is changing its methods and we want them to understand the need for local control. Um, in fact, most of this is local control issues. Um, I participated in the city county board meeting and it went well. It, um, I think for the, one of the first times we had some substance of, of discussion and what, what we took, took care of with some actions. Um, I want to bring to everyone's attention Sen uh, Assemblyman Chesbro's bill that he's putting forward where it will allow uh, county sheriffs to actually look into the purchasing and use of industrial farm equipment into possibly looking, taking our first step in controlling some of the outlying huge pot growing operations that are dewatering our creeks and um, are grading without permits and are operating without any oversight and that that's the first step into this that we're going to be able to actually track where it's going because that's part of the problem is that we I have aerials if anyone ever wants to see them of, of grading that is if a farmer were doing it he would be closed down and right now we have illegal pot growers that are doing it and it's, they're not being closed down. So that, I'm excited about that bill. I would also like to announce that um, we now have a local representative. She has been confirmed. She went through state confirmation. The Senate confirmed Irene Tynes as a um, member of our Regional Water Quality Control Board. And so that's the first time in the history, I think, of Del Norte County that we've actually move to that level and I think that will give us a good voice. And I would like to publicly thank um, Community Development Department that Mr. Hooper has a um, customer base of people that even when he tells them something that's not happy, they understand that he is, um, he communicates well with them and um, there's a lot of, of respect from the people who are working with him. So I would just like to thank him for doing such a good job. All right, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Hendrickson. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a, uh, uh, I was asked to attend a meeting uh, at the Smith River Rancheria um, for the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority. Uh, went with uh, Mr. Barnes and Ms. Kunstel and uh, Jim Bernard from the uh, airport. Uh, concerning the water and sewer line down Pebble Beach uh, to uh, service the uh, the new terminal building. Um, so we're getting uh, all parties involved uh, early on so that we don't run into any issues down the road. Um, I was also asked to attend a, uh, a meeting of the uh, chairman of the Solid Waste Task Force and staff uh, for Solid Waste um, on an informational meeting, uh, getting information on uh, um, the uh, ordinance 2008-1 uh, um, which was the landlord responsibility is what is called the landlord responsibility ordinance uh, just an informational um, I was just there to observe uh, had an agenda review for the solid waste authority uh, and then I went to Sacramento um, for a sustainable forest action coalition meeting uh, and you've heard me speak on this before. It, it now has grown to 20 counties. Um, uh, t uh, Congressman McClintock is there. There's also representatives from, uh, uh, well, those 20 counties, but there's also fire safe council people, um, um, industry people, um, uh, 
Senator Feinstein's office had representation, uh, Herger's office, um, and uh, trying to think of who else, but uh, um, Boxer's office. Uh, um, so th there's, it's a good group. Uh, we're talking about uh, socioeconomic uh, impacts of uh, not having legal activities going on in the forest, um, but uh, a lot of illegal uh, growing, um, the issue of catastrophic fires because of uh, fuels buildup. Um, we also talked about travel management, um, which um, Randy, oh, excuse me, Randy Moore from the, who was our Region 5 forester, um, was there uh, also along with his staff and very informative and and uh, he takes some pretty good shots uh, from everyone uh, because there were not very many happy counties um, with the way the management of the forests are going on. So um, we're continuing with that. Um, it was a good meeting. Um, uh, really happy to be on that, uh, that particular committee because there was a lot of uh, issues brought out and, and we're not alone with the issues that we have. Um, we're fortunate um, right now um, because of the fire season that's going on that we don't have fires um, because there are fires going on practically everywhere in California and it's just a matter of time before um, that happens here if we don't uh, initiate something towards some sort of uh, management in our forests. Uh, had a two by two meeting along with uh, Supervisor Sullivan, uh, state parks and national parks um, and Really, there wasn't a lot of stuff going on. We did uh, talk about Jed Smith a little bit, um, but uh, the National Park uh, uh, Supervisor, uh, Steve Cheney, is retiring, and his last day, I think, is Friday of this week. Um, he will be sorely missed. I think he was, you know, he was one of those people that uh, um, was very informative, had no problem with telling you what was going on. You may not like hearing what he had to say, um, but he was straight up with you. You know, I'm uh, really, really sorry to see him go because I really think he was a good thing for Delmar County. Um, so he'll be, at least in my view, he will be missed. Um, I attended the, uh, the home opener football game for Delmar County where my uh, brother Jeff was inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame. So I'm very proud of him. Uh, it was a great deal. And then uh, yesterday we had a uh, LAFCO meeting, local area formation uh, commission meeting um, where we discussed the MSR and the sphere of influence for the library district um, and we had some questions so we're bringing that back at the next meeting and that was it for me thank you supervisor Neymar. thank you it has been that it's almost exactly word for word that I had down for my last go meeting <laughs> and we're bringing the uh, bringing that back to the next meeting um, I also attended the Republican Women's uh, Luncheon last week, I think it was, where Rex White spoke um, in regards to his candidacy for the Harbor Board. Um, and I had known Wes from working with him. Wesley. No, no, no. Okay, there you go. Now, now can you hear me better? Come on, stick in the audience some night. Okay. Anyway, I, I had known him from uh, working with Solid Waste Management Authority. Attended the city county meeting, always good, just a little crowded if you can picture 10 more people, I mean five more people sitting up here. It is a little crowded. I also attended the farmer's market, um, which they always seem to have a great turnout and every time I've bought that corn and it's great. Good, good corn, you can't buy any better in the store. Um, also had, um, a meeting with some residents for Del Norte County uh, where I also had sheets available for people to sign uh, in regards to the regionalization of uh, the hospital and uh, attended the health care district also in regards to that and we're continuing to look at all avenues that may be available to us and that looks uh, like about it besides the last goal. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to thank Supervisor McNamer. She actually chaired the last meeting. I was on a family vacation, and, and so thank you, thank you, Leslie, for doing that. 
Um, so I'll try and be brief, but it's been a few weeks here. Uh, Del Norte Solid, Tennis, Del Norte Solid Waste Management Authority meeting, which by the way, you can see 10 people up here later today, Leslie. I know. <laughs> so um, attended the trade agency meeting, uh, attended the hospital town hall meeting, uh, which I think Supervisor McCullough probably uh, reported back on that. Just not very many people, uh, actually no one spoke in favor of regionalization. So the feedback was, um, Pretty much what you've been hearing um, is pretty negative on the regionalization. Um, what was odd, though, is a lot of contradictions that were said by Sutter during Sutter representatives during the meeting. Is they'd say one thing and then they'd say the other thing. So um, I think Dr. Duncan has done a great job of beginning to elevate the main points. And it would be if Sutter really would like to be in good light, is refute the points that he's put out there, and they haven't done that. So to me, that basically says if if they can't refute it, then it must be true. Um, so nothing good for the community on regionalization. I uh, attended a Safe Routes to Schools meeting with Supervisor McClure, Executive Director Tamara Layton, and Superintendent Olson and county staff regards to beginning to come up with uh, more walkable areas and looking at, you know, sidewalks, curbs, and gutters. There is money out there to begin to put stuff, but uh, in coordination with the school district, we have to develop a plan that is kind of um, developed more towards kids walking to school instead of driving to or being ri uh, driven to school. So. Um, there's hope over this next year um, that we can get the data together to actually request the funds to, to do some of those improvements. Um, met with Karen Kovacs at Fish and Game, um, just about some of the land issues they have in Dollar County. Uh, attending the groundbreaking for the Smith River Rancheria's Hotel, which is a, a very cool thing. It's nice to see there's, and from what I understand, they use a lot of local uh, people on the project. Um, that's always a, a promising thing. Uh, did a gender review, uh, attended the county fair and rodeo, uh, all very interesting uh, and well done. Uh, attended gen a gender review for city and county meeting. Uh, the also attended the rack meeting with Supervisor McClure, uh, and I would guess there may be a possibility a little more than the 2:30 if if we can get stuff reallocated, but for funds wise. But our four service projects, so we'll see see what uh, what projects gets presented to uh, to us at on the the 10th. Uh, attended the joint city county meeting um, and basically the idea is that we will on a regular basis have uh, meetings with the city uh, going forward uh, at least twice a year um, so some positive things coming out of that um, and we can get an RDA update today too right uh, all right had a two by me two meeting with with the parks and supervisor Hemmingson and uh, yeah we want to thank Steve Cheney who's the national superintendent of parks he's been very good to work with very uh, forthcoming um, and uh, we're going to be sad to see him go on that and wish him well on his trip moving back to Colorado. Um, I, I also, on the, the two trips I was able to make out of town, I want to uh, give special thanks to Jerry Cochran. He arranged for uh, myself and family to, to go take a tour of the Golden Gate Bridge and go up to the top. Um, I'll tell you, there is, it's, it's a pretty impressive structure. The elevator, however, only fits three people tight. I mean, you you have if you're claustrophobic, you are not going up in that elevator. Um, the other thing interesting is that along the catwalk that got railing stuff, but you're not attached to anything. You're up there on. It's a it's a pretty impressive, with the hard hat. That's about it. So in case yeah, it's I don't think anything's falling on your head though. So. <laughs> Um, very impressive. Um, I was uh, glad to get a chance to an opportunity to go up there, and I want to thank Jerry for for arranging that. Um, I did on just a quick note on the on the family vacation. Um, we uh, went to the Grand Canyon um, and a couple ten year olds, and just a Grand Canyon after the first day, they're like, "Yeah, we've seen this a million times, Dad. Let's go." So. Um, however, we did go to Tombstone, and we could have spent probably a week in Tombstone just on the gunfight at OK Corral, and, and shooting a six-shooter was much cooler than seeing what the Grand Canyon was. So, um, and it, it was good to see that part of Arizona. I had not, not gone to Tombstone personally before, and if you all get a chance to do it, they've got about four city blocks of the original design, original structures, except there's pavement on the road. Um, it, a couple, <laughs> it was funny because uh, my son and his, his friend Brent, Bryce went through the Boot Hill graveyard and they're looking for their last name on any of the tombstones and, and uh, Bryce found a few Howards in there and I think there was one Sullivan that was shot in there. So it was pretty interesting to see and trying to, to get them to, to relate to, to what happened during that time period. 
Um, it was kind of interesting. There are some politics behind the gunfight at OK Corral. So it was a, you know, the parties go way back, but there's a Democratic Republican thing. So it was, it's funny how these, just look it up. I'll encourage you to, to, uh, to look it up and see, uh, see uh, which was which, but it was, it was Democrat, or excuse me, it was uh, politically motivated on, on the, the gunfight that actually happened. So, and there's all kinds of different things as to who actually started the gunfight. So, um, and even there, they, they kind of throw it up. So, very interesting uh, trip. Uh, definitely, I would encourage you, if you ever get a chance to get a tombstone, don't go in August. That's when I went. I would go a little bit earlier. It was a little hot. So, other than that, um, I w at that, we will go ahead and go on to the, for the rest of the meeting. And we had a timed item, a public comment period. So, I'll go ahead and open public. Oh, and, sorry. I, yeah. Well, before we go to public comment, we'll do uh, listen to a brief report from our CAO, Mr. Serino. Uh, very quickly, the park improvements at Florence Keller, Birch, and Pike Field, the rubber mulch is now down, and there's been an expansion over at Pike Field. John Horner was the uh, coordinator of all of those projects and was assisted with our parks group and some of his uh, part-time temporaries. And uh, it does look very nice and is just a little bit safer than what it was before. Uh, I'll get into the, I'll do the legislation and budget a little bit later. Um, I would like to note that, you know, in regards to the uh, issue down in Klamath that uh, uh, Gary's office through public health uh, did a lot, uh, they took the role in coordinating agencies and that was uh, very helpful in getting that done. Uh, the uh, battery point project is to be finished by late September, about a month ahead of schedule and on budget. So that's uh, obviously we'll see what happens over the winter time and a few of those storms come through, but it should be very weather tight now and the electrical will be in much better position than it was before. And it also has a lightning suppression system. Um, and uh, I think that it would be about it for today. I'll talk about the legislation a little later too. There's a couple things that have come up just this morning. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, we will open public comments um, and jump right to that. Uh, members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you are addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. So I'll go ahead and open it up right now. No, all right, no public comment. We'll go ahead and close public comment then. and. We are a minute shy of our, of our uh, Forest Service presentation, so uh, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. Um, I got to. Uh, I'd, pull. I'd like to pull number four for a little bit of discussion. And okay. Six needs to be pulled for the report. Okay. Um, then I'll entertain a motion to. Uh, Accept the consent agenda minus four and six to be discussed. I so, I, I so move and at the same time would like to um, thank CDD for the report on Pebble Beach. Okay, do we have a second? A second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Any public comment on items on the consent agenda minus number four and number six, which we'll discuss. Okay, seeing no public comment on the consent agenda, uh, Joey, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor McNamer? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes, minus number one, I'm gonna abstain. I wasn't here for that particular meeting, so. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna go into our timed item, which is um, a presentation. Uh, receive a presentation from Tyrone Kelly regarding an update on the Smith River Nash, uh, NRA Restoration Motorized Travel Management Plan Environmental Impact here, Statement. Yeah, I don't see on. Tyrone. I, I did see Mary Kay. Are you, are you in here, at Tyrone's place? Okay, we can push it back in the meeting. Yeah. Okay, we'll do, we'll do that. Um, okay, so well, let's bring up number number four. Yeah, I, I just I, I was curious about the uh, uh, allowing excess of 40 hours a week. What is there a maximum? Are we or is that just open ended? Uh, um, I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, There's no particular maximum that's been established. It's really whatever is negotiated as part of the contract. 
Um, at this point, that's what's been requested by the district attorney's office. John, John if you want to approach the mic on, on that. Um, I, I was curious about the uh, allowing an excess of 40 hours a week um, for uh, um, for Mr. Mavris to uh, uh, to fulfill this contract uh, bothers me just a little bit um, that that we would need uh, need more than 40 hours a week. Uh, I know that you guys do put in a lot of hours, but. Um, concerned that there's not a cap on that. Yeah, I, I can appreciate your concern, Mr. Supervisor, when, especially when you're in a felony trial, there is no such thing as a 40 hour week. Uh, you put in your eight hours in court, as Ms. Stir can tell you as a, as a trial attorney as well. We have 48 witnesses coming in that have to be prepped. We have to see them in the morning before they hit the stand and then we prepare after that. You put in minimum 12 hours a day when you're in trial. That's before you get to something with the magnitude of this case, which is a capital trial. Um, I think, uh, like I said, if, you, if you're in the business, and I don't expect you know, lay people to you know, appreciate it as, as well, but there is no such thing as a 40 hour week when you're in a major trial. It is at least 50 to 60 hours a week. And, um, and I think it's appropriate for the, the amendment to be approved to accommodate that. Uh, especially given the magnitude of the Wyatt trial, which is only the second capital trial, I believe, in this county's history. Thank you. Any yes. questions for the DA? Okay. Fully reimbursable, Jay? Right. By the state? To the amount that is listed in here. At the, right. that, that amount of 192000 also includes other costs associated with the trial. Okay. Okay. Any other Thank questions you. or comments? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. You're welcome. I move to approve. Second. So move the second. Uh, Joey, could you pull the vote? Supervisor Finnegan? Yeah. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Wait, let me stop you in the middle of the vote, though. Uh, I don't think I have any public comment on that at all. Can I? I'll go ahead and open. I apologize. My error. Uh, any public comment on this? Okay. I'll bring it back. So go ahead and proceed, Joey. Supervisor McNamer? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. Okay, it's been moved and approved. Uh, item number six, uh, proven Mr. Chairman, I need to recuse myself on this item. Okay. Okay, number six is the same, is identical. The uh, report is identical in our agenda here that it was last time, and I know there's been some corrective action and a new direction that was given by the board, and I'd like to okay. have the report reflect something other than the contract that's before us. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, uh, Jim Barnes, uh, county engineer. And we had, uh, as you know, there's a, a, a few problems with the uh, Quinlan subdivision. And uh, one of the most important and is the drainage issue that uh, we had increased drainage on the neighbors downstream from the uh, subdivision. And that wasn't probably properly addressed in the uh, plan. So. And then we've also had a problem getting a contractor to go out and do the work. So what we're proposing is to uh, reconfigure the road so that the drainage goes back to the way it was historically. And that is the water's gonna run across the road and go to the north instead of running down the street to the west as it does now. And also, we're going to do some uh, concrete improvements along Endert so that the water doesn't pond down at the corner of Endert and uh, Quinlan. So because we've had trouble getting the, uh, a contractor out to do the work, there was a bond for $8,100 to fix improvements. We're going to have the uh, county road crew go in and fix the uh, road as well as do that concrete work along Endert. And that should be done within the next three weeks, three to four weeks. Okay. Good. And that's what I wanted to hear because it's on the record now because Exhibit A, uh, scope work, payment schedule, and unit pricing was in the, the book here was the same as it was before, and I knew that there had been changes. So as long as everybody understands, I would move to approve. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any public comment? Yes. I appreciate uh, 
Ron, get, you state your name for the record. Oh, I'm Ron Mayhew. I live on Quinlan 2613. Um, I appreciate uh, everybody's help on this, getting it fixed properly. It doesn't sound like uh, a concrete thing at the end is going to be a fix, in my opinion. It sounds like there still needs to be a uh, catch there. But I um, appreciate all your help getting it fixed, and I'm concerned about that if there's any further comment about that. When it was originally constructed, it was constructed to drain all the way down to the uh, catch basin, which is a little bit farther north than uh, your property. And so what I'll do is have the, uh, some of our survey crew go make sure that it's going to work. And uh, we're going to set it up in such a way that it will work. I mean, the idea is that it'll drain when we're all done. You may have to raise that grade of that gutter just a little bit in lieu of putting a DI there. We'll do what we have to. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Mr. Barnes. <laughs> Any other public comment? Okay. Uh, Joey, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor McNamer? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. And uh, thanks very much to CDD and specifically Jim, the engineering, for taking a look at this and making it work. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the time frame that it'll be done before winter starts. So, Tyrone, we're going to go ahead and bring you up so you, you don't have to actually sit down. So, um, at this point, we, we're going to go back to our timed item, uh, which was number, number 14 on the agenda, receive a presentation from Tyrone Kelly regarding an update on Smith River NRA Restoration Motorized Travel Management Project and Environmental Impact Statement. Thank you for coming. Uh, thanks for having us uh, come forward today. Really appreciate your time. <clears throat> I just wanted to give you an update on uh, travel management to make sure that we're uh, continuing to have this a dialogue and trying to work through uh, the coordination of this effort. And so, as you know, we put out the proposed action uh, for scoping and trying to get comments from the public about uh, what uh, we think from all the collaborative process that we've had uh, is where we should be headed. And so from that, uh, and we did get your comments, and we did through the regional forces office, which came a little bit late, uh, but uh, to me anyway, but I, it was timely filed, not saying that. Um, but anyway, in looking at that, uh, some of the concerns that you had about timing, I want to address those. As far as having more time in the comment period, I'll do that. <coughs> um, and some of the other comments that we've had as well. Uh, upon looking at the comments, and I had a couple others that asked about more time in the comment period, and looking at the, that fact that we don't worked on this for uh, quite some time, and we had the collaborative group look at the issues and try to address those, I thought it was more appropriate, uh, would be more helpful if we go ahead and look at those key issues, because we know a lot of what they are, and I'm going to mention those here in a minute, <clears throat> and look at those key issues and start to uh, flush out what the alternatives or draft alternatives might look like for the proposal. Uh, going forward and so spend that time uh, getting those alternatives together and then bringing those alternatives to you as well as to the public uh, to uh, formulate those alternatives or refine them in such a way uh, before we actually go out with the draft e EIS. <clears throat> so that was uh, the thinking along uh, the lines of continuing uh, with the scoping period and ending that scoping period on I think it was June 30th at the time that we had proposed and providing more time uh, to look at the draft alternatives uh, than more scoping uh, in the document. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, so we concluded the scoping. Uh, we got the comments from the public, and uh, there was quite a few comments. Uh, that being said, uh, once we looked at those comments, the key issues as we saw them, and we'll develop, develop alternatives around, and that's what I really wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, one was more motorized access. That was a key issue uh, that you brought forward as well as the users has brought forward. There are other issues that were brought forward to us uh, around the uh, inventory roadless areas and concerns associated with that. POC, Port Open Cedar, uh, root rot disease, and the closures associated with those and how they might be managed or looked at differently uh, was another uh, big issue. And the last one, uh, well, not the last one, the nat last natural resource issue or of a sort uh, was the other one, the botanical values uh, associated with those outstanding values here on, the, on uh, Smith River NRA. There were a couple other issues that were brought to our attention uh, of significance 
the, the roads or routes in the Hell Cow District, which is a nationally nominated district for, uh, nationally registered nominated historical district, and routes in those areas, uh, and how we address those, and through the consultation process with SHPO and also with the tribes and working with the, with the council, with the board here as well. And the other one was uh, subsistence gathering. Uh, that was a, the final issue that we brought forward. Uh, we had some discussion, we've had more discussion around those issues and think that those are the issues that we will flush out alternatives around uh, those. I don't know how, how many alternatives just yet. We're still having those discussions about those alternatives and how to, to build those alternatives. But as soon as we do, uh, we'll get you those issues <coughs> as well as what we see we think is the draft alternatives uh, and then start to have the dialogue, some meetings with the public uh, and post meetings with the, with the board here to discuss uh, you know, what those alternatives are and did we actually, from their comments to the scoping, uh, did we actually hit the mark or did we miss the mark or do we need to make some adjustments or there some alter is there an alternative or alternatives uh, that we need to look at uh, beyond what we have. Uh, so those, that's kind of where we are. We see the timing of this as uh, developing the draft alternatives are here the month of September. Uh, and providing that information to you, the board, and hopefully at, at that time, try to set a date to get out on, out on the ground as the board has requested uh, to actually look at some of the, <coughs> the, look at the alternatives and discuss those alternatives prior to going out to the public. And you know, we'll be doing our consultation with the tribes as well. Um, but that's when we're setting, we wanna set that in October. We don't have a date, but tentatively somewhere toward the end of October. Uh, then in November, uh, do the start our effects analysis once we flush out those all, well, I uh, missed a step. We also want to go, to, after we talk with you, we want to meet with the public uh, to talk about those draft alternatives and make sure as a collective uh, that we know, you know, that these are the alternatives that we're carrying forward and to the best of our ability, uh, those, those alternatives reflect the public's concerns and needs. Uh, and then we'd go into the, um, uh, the effects analysis and henceforth February, hopefully have a draft EIS and hopefully bring this process to a conclusion or to a decision, not conclusion, to a decision uh, somewhere next summer. Uh, but that's uh, where we are and I wanted to make sure I address that because I, I truly wanted to address your concern about more time in the scoping period. But I think that we want to spend more of that time in the de developing other alternatives in order to make sure that we got the information right that folks gave us and things that we might have missed, uh, we'd be able to address. And I think all the work we've done over the years to get to this point, I thought more time doing the development alternative would be more valuable. And that was just my assessment, more valuable to us than more scoping time. But uh, that's the update. Uh, and that's, I really wanted to make sure I touched base with you so you know exactly where we were in the process. Any, any questions from supervisors? Uh, yeah, I got uh, a couple of things, as you probably would expect. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the meeting that I uh, just came back from a meeting uh, with uh, Randy Moore, um, and it, it wasn't just Del Norte County, but uh, I'm going to say collectively all the counties are having issues with travel management. And one of those issues is the uh, parking no more than one car length off the road. And uh, I, I don't think there was a county that was there that didn't bring up that issue. Mm -hmm. And since, and Mr. Moore uh, indicated that there may be, uh, we may be able to allow an exception on some of the forests, uh, but he's not sure about that. But speaking to that, um, the dispersed campsites, and I didn't hear you mention that portion, and, and not so much the specific uh, campsites themselves, but the roads to those campsites, um, are going to be pretty important, especially if you can only park one car link off the road. People are not going to park their car off the road and then walk 300 yards to a campsite and leave their car unattended. That's just not going to happen. Um, so that needs to be addressed. Um, I think you've spoken to most of the other things that we were concerned with. Uh, you know, the, uh, of course, the roads that were not listed on the map are of, of concern because we're afraid that if those roads are not listed on the map, that under the review process, an annual review process, if the roads aren't there, they're not going to be discussed. So that's of concern. Um, the only other thing that, uh, uh, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, if, uh, Mr. Moore also mentioned that there's a forest plan review going on. 
and by the look on your face, I'm thinking that maybe you haven't started that process, <laughs> but we want to make sure that we're involved with that yeah. early, early on in the process. Yeah. Okay. I think the forest, we are due for a forest plan revision. I'm, I'm hoping I'm on the right track here. Right. And we haven't started that yet. They started with some forest uh, in the Sierras. Right. <laughs> okay. But that's going on, so I want to make that invitation now that we want to be part of that early on. I'd also uh, like to thank Julie Ranieri um, for uh, some information that I requested from her, very professional, and, and she always has been, and I really do appreciate you getting me the information that I requested um, quickly. So thanks a lot, I appreciate that. Thanks. Any, any other questions from supervisors? Uh, I, yeah, I, I appreciate you came up. Um, we always appreciate the communication. Um, I, I just, I, I think I have to, and not to harp on, on old stuff, it, it, I, I get a little confused when we go through the, all the facilitation stuff and then we end up with a different package than what everyone's pretty much at the table. I mean, I think, you know, I would reiterate once again, reiterate once again that we're down to less than 20 miles of, of what the, the issues were. Um, so it, it's not that far from uh, from a resolution on, on the whole thing, and hopefully that's where where we where we go to. So I appreciate the, uh, the invitation to we, we definitely the county absolutely positively wants to be involved in it. You guys are the biggest landowner in this county, so um, it affects the whole community. So uh, uh, environmentalists, recreational users, everyone's affected by it. So. Uh, we want to make sure that we're at the table, and we appreciate your uh, coming up and having the dialogue with us. So, uh, Supervisor McClure. I would just like to say thank you also, and thank all the crews that keep everything open. And my son this weekend hiked to Raspberry Lake and then climbed Preston Peak, and he said it was pretty gnarly. He's not sure he'll ever do it again. <laughs> but that kind of opportunity that people have is because of the Forest Service. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Any other? Nope. Okay. Thank, thanks. Right. Thanks. Uh, thank you. All right. Okay. We had another timed item, and uh, yes. Could I ask? I don't know if it had been mentioned or not, mentioned or not that we're not streaming. People will not be able to go back. And we are. I don't think our monitors reflect our that at all. Our monitors say not connect. Cable not connect. Oh, now mine's connected. There you go. I just turned it back on. Uh, it just but popped it, up. No, Sue Resume name, you're right. It just popped up. Okay. 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 Thank you. I guess we'll have that in our report later, right? Um, we are going to go on to item 15, and I need to recuse myself for item 15 due to a conflict of interest. And is Sue Resume name? As do I. I will, um, th this is not a uh, continuation of a public hearing, it's, we're just, we're opening a new public hearing for an appeal of the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors to requesting that road improvements associated with building permit B31995C located at 500 Teston Lane, Crescent City, California, be modified. Robin Hartwick, acting as agent for Terry Vance, has requested that road improvements for 500 Tetson Lane be modified, elimin eliminating the paving requirement. And the condition reads, and this is for a building permit, prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall construct a roadbed that is 20 feet wide with four foot graded shoulders and drainage features designed to carry runoff from a 10-year storm for the full frontage of their property, a distance of 194 feet. 
The shoulders shall be constructed with four inches of compacted three quarter inch minus aggregate base. The right of way width shall be 50 feet. The road shall be constructed of seven inches of compacted three quarter inch minus aggregate base and two inches of asphalt paving 20 feet wide. Five hundred Tetson Lane is located at the most western end of Tetson Lane, um, or existing improved portion of Tetson Lane. And Tetson Lane is located northwest of the intersection of Elk Valley Crossroad and Lake Earl Drive. Uh, the condition was drafted based upon a couple county codes. Uh, the county's code is meant for new development. Um, and this particular road happens to be a uh, existing road in an existing subdivision. So we have to use the county's road improvement code as a guide to, to development. Through that, the uh, lot split review committee, also known as the ERC, recommended the condition to the planning commission, which is how it was developed. It is a condition that takes interpretation to create um, and so you will see I gave you a handout with the improved portion of Tetson Lane and the unimproved portion. The improved portion epitomizes the county's goal for private rural roads uh, for development of for the development of four to twenty one lots. It's based upon the concept that the construction of private rural roads, which will serve land, which has been divided or could be divided, uh, will be paved upon the ultimate build out of the community. In this case, we have, I think, about 10 lots that have already been completely built out all the way through paving. And so to, con to continue with order orderly development, this condition was placed on the permit. The applicant is asking for it to be eliminated um, due to the expense not deferred. Um, the request for a modification does not appear to be consistent with county code. However, a deferred improvement does. If the board were to do a deferred improvement agreement, they could make it prior to a first mortgage, which in this case wouldn't apply. Um, prior to the development of an adjacent parcel. Uh, for a period of time or something similar to that, it, it's not set on what it has to be deferred to. Um, the applicant doesn't desire the deferred improvement agreement. They would like it just simply eliminated. Their, their concern or their we spoke with them a little bit about why do you want it eliminated? And they said that simply if, if it cannot be eliminated, the transaction is not going to occur, which includes a realtor selling a piece of land, a contractor building a home, um, and of course the buyer and the seller. So that's four people in the local community who would be severely impacted by this. Um, are there any questions? Madam Chair, I do have a couple of questions. Um, the road doesn't appear to line up on these parcel maps. Is it that does not appear to line up? The road doesn't line up with the rest of the road. On the on at, at the end of seven, seven and twenty, where it where it meets thirteen and fourteen, it jogs over a little bit. I've never noticed that before. Um, uh, yeah, but that concerns me that that doesn't line up, um, uh, and I don't know what we go back, how we go back to fix that. Um, my other concern is um, to not have that improvement. That we've got so many roads in this county now that have this issue of not being paved and. I hear complaints on a weekly basis. Um, is there, uh, if 
if they don't want to pave it, is there a maintenance agreement that they will maintain that road? No. I mean, there's got to be something because that doesn't that doesn't happen uh, in other in other areas. And and uh, I'm certainly not against a, a, maybe a deferment, but how how are we assured that that deferment uh, once the trigger is set off um, that the the road ends up getting paved? I mean, is there do they put up a bond? Do they or do we just figure that, yeah, they'll do it when, when the trigger, whatever triggers that deferment to go in, uh, to be rescinded and go into play? The deferred improvement agreement is recorded against the property, so it travels with the property. As far as putting up money or some security other than the agreement, I don't believe it exists. Okay. I have a, do you have a question, Mike? I do. Um, on lot, we're looking at lot 14 as the lot to be developed. And can you tell me the lot 15, 16, and 13 are currently undeveloped? Is that correct? I, I believe lots 13 and 16 are, have the same owner, and lot 13 has a house on it, and 16 doesn't, but it's a uh, horse pasture or something to that effect. And, and when 15, lot 15 isn't developed. And when lot 13 was developed, there was no, they did not do a um, blacktop there. It does not appear. It appears that at some time the community got organized and paved Hudson Lane and based on the paving it appears that lot 13 contributed to paving the rest of Tetson Lane because it's continuous. Whether that's true I don't know. And and the cul-de-sac is not paved. So there's no pavement here for these four lots. No, you will, you will actually see in the picture, there's a big white spot in the center, and that's actually a gate. And so it appears that the end of Tetson Lane is actually somebody's property, but actually that's just in the middle of the right-of-way. And it's a gate to one piece of property. Okay. Can they put a gate in the right-of-way? They're not supposed to, but it is a private road, so we, we will handle that. Um, I too have lots of people calling me wanting to know why isn't my road paved and someone else's road paved but I know that historically almost every every road off of Parkway that's paved is because the community got together and paved it and the road conditions that were required were the width and the amount of crushed rock but not two inches of blacktop because, and, and historically, if I go down, I can go down a park view and I think turn to another park place and it's not paved. I can get back in there. I can go down Dundas and then I can turn and go down and they're not paved. And this is the first time we've ever done that where we've actually taken the step to add since I've been here that we've ever taken a step to add on a private road the demand for blacktop. Because that has been a, um, that has been the community getting together. I know it's been a nightmare at the one out on, um, was it Pine Grove Road? Not Pine Grove, it's off of uh, railroad there where there was a section that was paved and then there were some big holes and then there was a section that was paved because that was the neighborhood's responsibility because I don't believe that we can get into unless we're going to incorporate these roads into our road system and take responsibility I'm not sure we can take that next leap and start requiring the blacktop and so for me looking at the where this ends I I would have no need to see blacktop happen to those four parcels mm -hmm. but the other road conditions absolutely and the gate needs to go bye-bye since it's a it's a right away can, can I ask you a question mm -hmm. on so our, our code um, I'm looking at the second page behind your pictures mm -hmm. this is this code is based on the concept of a new subdivision coming in or and applying roads not an existing subdivision and that's where the exit where, so this code has us building up to 21, 
lots, you, when you get between 11 and 21 lots that it could serve, it requires paving. In a new subdivision. In a new subdivision. And then if you go to, I guess it would be the last page of your uh, packet of the board memo, there's the standards for existing roads. And this is how the paving component got applied. So if that interpretation is not correct, can you give us some direction? Well, you, ca you can't call this a new subdivision. No, we're Sorry. not. We're not. Okay, and so this one says that you are going to, um, will be the guide. So the new road standard will be the guide, mm -hmm. but it's only a guide. Yes. And so when this subdivision was developed, it was developed to the same road standards of the, the, the um, easement amount, the amount of rock, the grading, the, the drainage, all of that was defined. And so for, for me to say that we can take an old subdivision and ap apply new road rules doesn't make sense to me. Because for instance, if I had somebody build, God forbid, a new house on Napa, are you gonna require that road to be get to get blacktopped um, because that road is in horrific shape, and so that kind of and I know that the, I know how the rules go where you develop in from the from the outer, and here we are at the end, but I don't believe that the application of blacktop should be that expense should be at the discretion of the community and the homeowner, not at the demand of the county on a private road so in an existing subdivision okay. that's where i am and i just had a question to robin you said that the this was originally four different subdivisions so the, i'm assuming this was the latest of the you don't know yeah i'm sorry you should be at the mic Okay, anybody else has questions? First of all, the, the interpretation of that is highly incorrect. I'd actually like to have you review the code. I have copies of that if you like. Um, this has been a desperately frustrating situation for me. It required a lot of time and energy going through this. It's going to get hurt. Not going to the cost. You really have to be on the mic for the record in a public hearing. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, <laughs> sorry, I can't talk. The, the thing I just gave you is, um, it has the code numbers there. It doesn't have the actual code. I have the code here. If and you, you have it. to identify yourself for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, my name is Robin Hartwick. I'm a real estate agent, and I'm acting on behalf of the future buyer for 500 Tedson Lane once it's developed and also for Terry Vance, who is the owner of the proper cur property currently. Um, so if you, if you look through this, we actually hired Lee Trombull. Um, this is something I knew that I've talked to Rosanna about several times. Um, it was brought to her attention several times. What they're asking us to do is actually above and beyond what the, co the county code calls for. And it's probably not the right forum to kind of go through our conversations over the phone or the information back and forth, but it, it's been so frustrating. At first she said that it was a county maintained road. And when I ask for um, a reason as to why it had to be paved after she told my husband it wouldn't have to be paved, um, I came down to the office because what she told me was incorrect and the the documentation she showed me was actually for still for a county maintained road so I again pointed out it's not a county maintained road it's a private road and um, she all along the way has been looking for a reason why we have to pave it and the county just it, the code does not require it and what she's calling interpretation before she was calling um, Sorry, I'm nervous standing up here. Um, orderly development and intention. And it basically just boils down to it's, I mean, I really feel like it's stuff that she's just making up because she originally said it needed to be paid and she didn't want to change her findings. 
Um, the reason that we chose to base our appeal on the um, financial issue, which is entirely true, it is a financial hardship to try and pave that road. Um, it's, she had actually called, I guess, and got a quote, or not a quote, but a material cost from Hemingson, and her findings said that it wasn't a financial. I mean, I think her cost said it was going to be 5000 which isn't right. We got an actual bid from it, and it was over 7000 but, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, taking 7000 out of my pocket or my building project for the year is a big deal. So it is a financial hardship. But that she had actually directed me to make it a financial hardship and said that she would change her findings based on that result and still didn't change her findings. And you had pointed out the same thing, you know, if we were to do a deferred, which would put it on the homeowner, which the homeowner isn't willing to do, they're not going to pave the road. Um, there isn't any enforcement for it. And she pointed that out to us too, saying just accept the deferment because you'll never have to do it, which is ridiculous. I don't any think I have anything else, sorry. Uh, the bid that you got, that was for the paving only? That was for material and paving, to pave the road. Just for the paving though, not for the... Not correct, for the just, gravel. just for the paving, correct. Not for the gravel that you would have I, to do. I believe that's correct. I just got that this morning. I can show you a... I'm just, I'm just curious. I, my, I have more of a concern with the road not lining up. And, um, and, and with there already being a, a, a house on lot 13, with a house already being on lot 13, I think to make it retroactive and you're going to build right across the street. Well, uh, and that's the other thing. I mean, if you... I didn't provide you with the code, though I have it here. The county code says over 11 properties. Well, we're only the 10th property. And when she used that to say that's why we have to pave the road, she had told me that she was using a Google map and counting residences, but she was counting a shop as a residence. So when that wasn't the reason why we had to pave it anymore, well, then she changed her reason as to why we had to pave it again and came up with something else, which is her interpretation, which is a poor interpretation of, of what's there. Can I ask, Robin, do you know how old the uh, residence is on lot 13? How long ago that was done? And that didn't require pavement? I, I'm not sure how old that house is. I have a question for you as a realtor. Mm -hmm. um, you know the roads that I'm talking about, like off of Parkway. I do. And my guess is it could be a third of them at least that have Easily. no blacktop. And that the, the houses, the community has chosen not to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like you had said, there are several that have partial pavement, but there's been future development even very recent future development where it was not required because the county code doesn't require it. That was going to be my next question. Are you aware of any houses that have been built on any of those roads that re were required to have? Not a one. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I think that's all. Thank you. For you. Would anyone else like to speak to this matter? Yes. My name is Phil Baggett. I live at Tedson, on Tedson Lane at 305 Tedson Lane. And, um, Do you know your parcel number? Do you know your parcel number? Uh, not exactly. I have paperwork that might have it on here. I was going to bring it uh, towards you guys. Maybe you know, shed some the light on it. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth lot in, that would give us a, be, an uh, idea of where you're at. Third, rod, third lot on the right as you drive okay. down. Okay. Okay. I'm next door to Babbage, uh, if you know where he lives. Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, I brought in some stuff that may help clarify, but the, the gate there is uh, operated by a push button by anybody who wants to open it on that piece of property. So that just swings open. 
and those homeowners, I, I believe it might have been paved already, partially there, they redid it back into that corner behind that gate. I don't know if you have pictures that show that or whatever. No, but the, they the went ahead and paved it. Um, I think I heard you guys discussing whether that was part of the whatever, but they paved their driveway and Tetson Lane when, when they bought it, or after they bought it, it may have been paved already, but the gate was put in just for their privacy, but anybody can push the button and go through, and that's just a normal knowledge thing that they did, but they are talking about removing that gate and putting it at the front of the driveway, you know, whenever the property sell or mm -hmm. uh, things like that happen. Um, as far as the pavement of the road, it was definitely a community thing. We have improved the property over the years, and that's um, the concern of my part. Is that was the attraction at the time that I um, went to uh, purchase the property and build a home there. And other people prior to me, I guess I was probably the last person that built a home on that on that road. So I've been there about 20 years, about 1990. So all those other homes are older. And that road wasn't paved when you built, was it? Yes, it was. Oh, so. So that was the attraction of coming to that neighborhood. Okay, that's what I thought you said in and the beginning, but I didn't think it had been paved that many years. Um, so you're saying. It's well established. That th this is paved so far, then it's unpaved where these properties just, just where are breaks, in concern breaks away from and that's paved yeah. beyond. It, it's paved all the way back to the property that, that you're talking about. It's right. 13. Uh -huh. And it goes off into their property there. It's paved up to there and right. over. So part of that is already done that would be part of the other properties that are in question. Oh, I thought you were saying earlier that back at the gate where the gate is, it's paved. Behind it, yes. I don't know if your pictures show that. So you well, I'm picture not that. sure. In other no, words, they open that gate, they're still on paved road. I, I past the but gate. it just the goes gate. like that. It into goes right straight on over oh, there. there. It's so not a road as much as it is. Just yeah, so they did part of their oh, part okay. that I guess would cover the part of their front of their property. But it does do a little cul de sac thing around in there. I think it's planned that way. You know, But the cul de sac's not paved. I have a walk back in there quite a bit, you know. So th actually, that's part of the situation here is I can understand maybe property owners wanting to do the gravel deal under construction when they're pulling out all the trees, you got heavy trucks going in there, doing all that kind of work, that you wouldn't want to have new pavement and me breaking it up. At the same token, all that stuff is going to be coming out on our paved road. So that's one of our concerns is the gravel and the mud and everything else will be doing damage to the rest of the road. And if I can submit these papers to me that shows that where I bought, when I bought the property was brought up to me that uh, the road cost of paving would be $739 to be paid by the seller before closing of escrow. Before we made that deal, they tried to make me pay it. And I said, I consider that part of the $32,000 I had to pay for the piece of property. And that was the attraction for me to buy the property. So I consider that part of the deal. And they went ahead and agreed to pay it and not me pay it, the seller. So that's in writing there. And if you look at some of the uh, other stuff that the realtor wrote, she wrote a lot of things that were, she said, uh, due to, I think it was customary actions that was common in California, I mean, in Del Norte County, I think this is the way she said it. Um, I believe it was Jacqueline Motes was my realtor at the time. And they wrote that up to say everything was, this is the way we do things in Delaware County. So I said, okay, I guess I have to go along with that, you know. So if I, my neighborhood was already paved, then when I buy into that property, I'm going along with the customary things of Delaware County or, or my people in my neighborhood. So I'm saying um, they're going to eventually have to pave it. And if by modifying it, they may just be able to go wave this piece of paper and say, oh, I don't ever have to pay it because I've uh, appealed it. And you guys said, oh, we went under the guidelines then, and we went jumped over what the neighborhood 
has built it all up on, which also raised all the property values of every house, which the county politely gets property tax from, and yet they don't have to maintain the road. So I, I can see where that's behooving the county to say, hey, I think they need to pay this at some point down the road. There needs to be a time put on it that it has to be done. I can understand being under you know, construction. You'd want to put the road base in, which is part of the paving of the $7,000. You have to lay on a road base before you can pay it. So they have to put in a road base, period. So they're already halfway there that they're going to have to pay to their pavement. So why not go ahead and let them out of the paving, paving of it? Because they're still going to use part of our road. And I have a, documents that are recorded with the county that says I have to maintain this road. I just like to show you all this stuff. You guys just uh, can I ask you a question? You make up your mind what to do with an already whole area. Yes, Mark. Can I ask a couple of questions? Okay. So, do you have a neighborhood road agreement for yes, that subdivision? That's what's in here. But do you recognize that the, where this other piece starts, it's not the same subdivision? And uh, it, yes. Somewhat, and yes. so my question becomes: If you you have a recorded neighborhood agreement, mm -hmm. and I'm over sure you the understand and, all that too. and over the twenty years, uh -huh. um, there's probably been some improvements that have had to been done, or there's probably Even, yeah, over or, forty years or whatever. And you've all paid in, and mm -hmm. and you do that. Mm -hmm. That's part of the agreement. But that's part of the, the but that's part of the agreement of that subdivision. Yes, when you okay. buy the property. This is a different subdivision. And this subdivision doesn't carry that. It's not part of that neighborhood agreement. Well, at the time I bought my house, all this was already subdivided. Y yes, it's all subdivided, yes. but it was subdivided. It was subdivided at different times. And whoever did that first lane, Tedson, mm -hmm. and did the paving. It was on gravel, probably. I would guess, and I don't know because yeah. I don't have I, a, a, a I don't historic have Google's uh, a historic. Either perspective on this uh -huh. one but when that was done and when you went to buy your when you went to buy your house in 1990 yeah. that road agreement that neighborhood road agreement was in agreement okay. Okay. now I can tell you that um, uh, 20 years ago when Collins Drive when Collins Road was gravel mm -hmm. the neighbors got together and did a road agreement to put down the blacktop there were a couple that, that didn't, and the rest of the neighborhood decided that they would all buy in and pay it anyway because they were blacktopping it. Because that's what private roads do, yeah. in the county, it has to be a neighborhood agreement. And my position is this isn't a new subdivision. If this were a brand new subdivision like we just had out off of um, Northcrest, all of that had to be blacktopped because that's the new rule that we have on new subdivisions. But this is an infill of an existing subdivision. And that would be like an infill on Parkview. If, if that, and I'm hoping Parkview is one of them that's not um, blacktopped. But that in, infill doesn't pull the trigger as a new subdivision. And that's where my issue is, is that this, this doesn't pull that trigger. It was a new subdivision when they started it all, back 40 years ago. And back 40 years okay. ago, it, it had a road so, requirement. Which is a condition that's on there. It says four inches of gravel, 16 yes, feet wide. Yes, it does all that, yes. But we also have agreements okay. and things that, as you buy into that area, and you use this road, you, you, if you use our roads, you become part of the agreement, I would say. I'm afraid. It's like uh, we and, I, and, and I haven't. Can I yeah. see the agreement? I, I think not, that I'm your agreement, <laughs> that your agreement probably only goes to um, lot seven, twenty, nineteen, eight, nine, eighteen, seventeen, and ten. I think so too. That's that is the agreement. So even thirteen didn't have to pay. Or not if they wasn't wanted. a requirement. It wasn't even a requirement of the permit. I don't. I don't know. It's, I'm going to call. It was a requirement of mine. Well, it was a condition to pay, to pay it, into. It mine was a condition of the permit for 13. Yeah. For 
for 13 not for 13. Oh, oh maybe not for 13. that's for what this? i'm going to ask county staff about that but yeah, yeah i know it's it's uh but i don't know how you expect you know to raise your your community values up if you don't uphold something here oh i get that yeah, yeah. <laughs> i get that yeah, yeah but at the same time as long as the county is con continuing to allow private roads to be developed at a standard that requires just the rock right which is per half away of the pavement now yeah. unless we change that rule yeah. and yeah. make it retroactive to historic subdivisions we can't apply the new rule to the old subdivision so you, you do you have sort of any intermediate intermediary rule that was like okay you're going to be doing construction on a lot of wet property back in there a lot especially the 13 acres in behind oh there'll be there there are There's grading a lot of issues there are issues going on back there big there time. will be grading and wetland analysis um, and all of that yeah. has to be done as part and of the, the access permit. to all this but is that's across. separate to the road so um how do you attach uh, if they do damage to tetson lanes uh road improvement uh does that go into civil litigation or is that part of the county problem that's yours Oh. I hate to say that, but I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to. I mean, we're not dealing just with, you know, pebbles and rocks here. We're dealing with, you know, uh, the future of the county. You know, so what I'm going to try to find out is how far did this agreement reach? And that's what I will have to ask with county. Yeah, yeah. But I can understand them not wanting to do paving right away. I, I can agree to that. I can submit to that. But they, they, they just can't be released from ever, ever, ever doing it. Just because they're a new subdivision or are part i don't know see there you go again and i, I didn't they're a development on an existing me, lot that, that was pre-subdivided yeah, 20 something years ago that all looked like it was all still the same subdivision being developed out and because we paved it in order to get along with the wet weather we have up here um, i can see why the people and, paved it. and we're going to have that issues back there when they pull all this stuff out and i'll tell you my guess is uh -huh on subdivision law that these were divided at four times because it went into four lots each time because that doesn't that doesn't trigger a whole bunch of development stuff if, if I have a parcel and I divide it into four uh -huh. I'm still under the sub I, I'm not then part of the subdivision act that I have to move I, it doesn't ratchet up what I have to do if I had a parcel and I divided it in is it five Tina five or more when the trigger hap I mean, there's a point where your trigger happens, and that's probably why we see four subdivisions. So when you get enough people living back there, with, have built in and built out, you know, I mean, then borrowing a line from Seinfeld is, if not now, when? You know. At <laughs> when, the will of the property owner. When become part of the community? At the will of the property owner. Yeah. I. I I, I'm just or, trying or, to or demand or litigations or I mean it could go on. I don't know. Does it have to? I mean, no. I wish that the property, I wish the owner, property owner would say. Owner would have talked to the people on the block and you know, just this is completely different. What I received, what was going to happen here, and I get here it's going to be modified with asterisks, which the asterisks on your agenda doesn't even say what the asterisks mean. You know, I'm at a loss there. Okay. So I mean, I see this was uh, this is a big thing going on affecting four when an appeal four people that are uh, when in, an in a, the county here. When an appeal happens, it uh -huh. comes to the board, and the board can choose to accept, uh -huh. or can deny the appeal, yeah, or can accept modifications to the yeah. appeal because that's the appeal process. Right. Right. Okay. So based that, upon other things that we we're talking about. Based upon a whole bunch of other rules yeah, right. that we have to follow. <laughs> But I would, do you mind if I ask staff a few questions? Oh, you can go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. Here's the chair. I'm sorry, did I? No, no, you're, you were fine. Um, are you through, Mr. Baggett, or were there more questions for? Oh, well, I don't know. I'm just trying to raise the concerns of if not now, when? And how do you stipulate that somehow? Well, it appears as though there was conditions on your deed. Are there any conditions on these other four uh, deeds? That's, no. Hang, hang on just no, a second. No, we're going to go through the staff first. I would just like to address the, how we got to the point of requesting the pavement. And on the back of your packet, yeah, the, back. Um, the standards for existing roads, it, it, and this is to address his question, 
where further development is proposed on an existing substandard private road, the standard for new roads shall be applied, or may be applied. Shall used be used as a guide. guide. Maybe. And that's what we're attempting to do here, is to, to prevent further problems with unmaintained private roads that, that there is no recourse, basically. And this was an attempt to say, this is where we start. We're going forward. We're going to try and do some orderly development and prevent further deterioration and problems in these neighborhoods because there will be further develop, development back there and it will just exacerbate the problem. Um, that was, I don't believe it was four subdivisions. I believe it was three subdivisions, but as Supervisor McClure pointed out. It triggers. So that's how the, the road standards were avoided, whether it was intentional or or accidental, the road standards couldn't be applied at that point. But um, the position we were taking is, is that perhaps now we go forward using this as a guideline and say, let's improve these. If we de defer the uh, actual paving, um, the trigger could be further development down on that road. Um, it appears to be a there are further cul de sac. Lots. There's a cul de sac but the road on the property in question continues around. There's further property back there that may be developed in the future. You mean that cul-de-sac isn't going to be the end of the road? Uh, I don't show a right-of-way. The away. road continues around. It, it doesn't show it, a right-of-way, though. No, it doesn't, but there is further property back there that could be I developed. know, but there's no right-of-way. No. no. So that, that, other property, that other property has another ingress and egress. It's behind it. We drove right behind that. So, uh, but was it legal? There is a right of way. <laughs> it's not showing on the it's map. It's not showing on the map no. at all. Wait. So it's not it's not showing it's on not. the map. No, so it's not. So I don't have any information okay. whether there's a deeded right. And of now I have another question on that on that standard for existing. Do you mind if I ask? No, Sorry. go right ahead. Um, the lot split review committee shall make recommendations to the planning commission That's I, that would make me that would give me the assumption that this road standard is being applied when there's a lot split when it went through erc erc slash lot split review okay committee. so that has that that's it's semantic okay yes do you have any more questions for team well, I'm, I'm real confused now because well, if I don't see a road right away and that being the basis that there's for further development when I only see one more, two more places to be developed. At this point, I'm gonna, we're going to have to take about a two-minute break <laughs> or, I won't, or I won't be able to sit still. Thank you for the indulgence. No problem. <laughs> Why don't you make any quick decisions? <laughs> Thank you.
continue now. Um, Mr. Vance, you wanted to speak to this? Uh, my name is Terry Vance. I'm the property owner. When I purchased the property, I just want to state that there was no road agreement that I was required to sign to, when I purchased the property on a condition of improving the road. You don't have a, you don't have a recorded, you don't I, have a recorded uh, road maintenance agreement? I don't. Just real quickly, the lot next to us is also for sale. We didn't purchase that lot because, in my opinion and in my buyer's opinion, it wasn't suitable for development. The 13 acres, which is the one lot beyond this, has been for sale for over five years and hasn't sold for the same reason. The thought of that being split into more developable lots is not feasible. It's a wetland back there. Um, the property that was said to be paved after the gate is not paved at all. They have a driveway, but Tedson is not paved beyond that gate. There's a driveway that is entirely on their property that goes to their house. Um, and uh, there's already a bed of gravel that goes back. Um, and the requirement for that was four inches, not seven inches, as the recommendation is underneath the two inches of pavement. And um, as far as the concerned property owner, we will do everything we can to maintain the road. You're right, it does add value. Um, it adds value certainly to the property that you know, we'd be building to, as will a brand new house at the end of the road. And we'll be very conscious about the five loads. There are five loads of log that'll come off of there, which will be 10 trips by a truck. Um, so it, it'll be minimal as far as uh, the development of that. And we'll be very cautious and careful with that. We have no intentions of, uh, not taking care of, you know, any any damage we would do or otherwise. Thank you, Robin. We You're can't welcome. we can't have discussion back and yeah. forth from the audience. Um, also, I wanted to add there are indeed four subdivisions. The first one where this gentleman is was done in '89. Across the way from him, those four were done in '79. The one that um, we're building on was done in '87, and then the one beyond that, that 13 acres, I don't have a date for that, but. Um, it may have been a remainder from the 87, would be my guess. I don't know. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Mr. Hartwick. Hi, my name's Ed Hartwick, and I just wanted to uh, mention to the neighbor that his neighbor actually has a trucking company that lives on Tetson Lane. So our five loads of trucks aren't really going to add to the road damage. Thank you. Pardon me? Can you do, uh, I'm he sorry. Wants to, he wants to rebut that. As I mentioned, Henry Babbage has a construction company there. He drink, brings in one truck in and out of the time unloaded. And uh, he realizes that some of the road uh, is alligator, but I don't think he'll would say it was my trucks because we have a garbage truck that comes down through there, you know, stuff like that. Right. But these trucks, as is mentioned, will be heavily loaded with some nice size logs. And so okay, we're concerned about that also. Thank you. Okay, is there any more comment? Yes. One, one further comment on the uh, handout you received uh, with the construction standards. Uh, where it refers to four to 20 lots inclusive. It says it shall apply to the construction, uh, blah, 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 um, which has been divided or could be divided. It doesn't mean all happened at once. It, where are you? On the last handout you received, what's the picture? 12.05.030, mm -hmm. four to 20 lots. The standard shall apply to the construction of private rural roads, which will serve land which has been divided or could be divided into not less than four. So that would make me believe that if it, whether it happened all at once or not, if we're going to apply the guidelines, it doesn't matter whether those were subdivided all at one time or not. They could have been and they have been. There are more uh, than four but less than 20.
I'm wondering if what, what they gave us came directly from the code book. Is it a direct translation? Or is it, a, I mean, is it a translation or is it directly taken from the code? Because I've asked several times for any kind of documentation showing that it would need to be paved and I've never been able to get anything from her. The, the things that she actually gave me, I printed out right. um, directly, the code. You have to address that. So you, oh, sorry. You can't talk to the audience. Sorry. Sure, sorry. <laughs> um, all, all, of the th all of the codes that um, she gave me and are cited are here, and all of them say it does not need to, be po need to be paved. And that thing actually says 1 to 20 lots or more um, that she just read, and we are not... Um, it doesn't apply to us. Thank you. Would be my argument. Sorry. Oh, and I also wanted to say that um, the road is actually paved almost up to our lot or to our lot. I'm not exactly sure where that line goes. Um, and they're not asking us, you know, to pave an entry to our lot, which would be minimal. They're asking us to pave the entire frontage of the lot, which is almost 200 feet. Um, and additionally, um, there was supposed to be a change that the recommendation was written and appeared to say that the hammerhead would also be, need to be paved um, the way I read it. And uh, the county engineer said that that was not her intention and that she would be changing that. So I just want to make sure that that is changed as well um, if, if we don't have a ruling in our favor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else that hasn't spoken on this issue have anything to say? Or to add to it? Hearing none, I will close the public comment and bring it back to the board. Well, I'm pretty confused in relationship to that easement. If there's a, if, if I'm being given a, a map that identifies the easement as ending at a hammerhead, and there's property still behind this on um, a different section, different map, that I have to then make the assumption that that property has different ingress and egress identified with it, however it gets developed. Because otherwise I would see a, um, I would see a declared easement going all the way through property 15 and 16, and I don't see that. Um, and when I look at the recorded deeds here of the, pro of the, the, two, um, the two road agreement signatures, mm -hmm. um, it was four properties that agreed to the road agreement. And they were, it says that they're parcel one, two, three, and four. Um, and I don't even have a one, two, three. I have a four on here. So I, maybe they've been since renumbered or something. But it was the um, Dansman, Tryon, Arnold, and Reichlin properties. And I, and I have no way to identify where those are. No. Reichlin's used to be on the left side as you drove in to Tadson. And then the okay. other is Tedson, Wood, Wright, Arnold, Reichland, and Kazmar. And those are the people who have agreed. And that, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six. And I, maybe Reichland had two properties there. So I have 10. I have 10, 10 people that have signed on as, as, as a road agreement but I have no idea which properties those are on in these documents, other than knowing that I don't have parcel 14, 15, 13, and 16 are not part of the, um, the land road maintenance agreement. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I know what you're saying. And I know it's problematic, and it needs to be if it's not part of that deed when you buy the property, if that road agreement, you can't, it's closed. Robert, yeah, it's we closed. closed public comment. Um, if that road agreement is not part of the deed, 
and you buy your property, I don't know how we can take that next leap to require a neighborhood road agreement to be extended to a, another property. So that's where I am. Um, I, I guess at some point then we need to make make it more clear yes. so we can understand even though staff appears to understand uh, I I gotta tell you this is a real issue this this uh, pulls me in in both directions uh, um, I understand the, the the property rights of an owner that that does not have conditions on their property and can we shove that down their throat um, on the other hand um, you're getting full utilization of the road that has been put in for your property and are not willing to contribute. So I have a real issue with that. And then I know that down the road, if I'm a supervisor the next term around, that I'm gonna get complaints about the condition of the road. Um, so I, I'm, I, you know, and, and there certainly is, uh, is no cheaper time to, to put the improvement in than, than now. As, as you go down, you know, down the road, it's gonna be more expensive. So I, I got a real dilemma. I'm, I'm certainly in favor of property rights and don't wanna be putting something, uh, some condition on there that, uh, that is not needed. And I, and I do think we need to solve the issue, but maybe it needs to be more clear uh, so that the board can, can really grasp this and say, yeah, that's definite. They, they either need to put it on there or no, they don't need to put it on there. It's, it's kind of in the middle there on, on you're asking us to make a decision on, uh, uh, you know, which is a judgment call, I guess, any way you look at it. But uh, I, I, got a, I got a real dilemma. I agree. Uh, I just feel like we're really put on, on the spot here. Um, I agree with Mr. Baggett that, you know, they will have full use of a paved road, which is very nice to their advantage. Um, but again, when that property was purchased, those, there weren't any deed restrictions on there as far as paving the road. Um, they're like, like Supervisor McClure said, they're all over this county. My sister-in-law lives on one on Parkway Drive. That is par paved all the way down and ends, I do believe, at a lady's property that, that did not contribute or didn't have to contribute to that pavement. Um, just like you said, sometimes some of, the, some of the neighbors say, no, I'm not gonna help contribute. Well, they're having full advantage of that road too and never had to contribute. Um, I wish we weren't sitting here in this dilemma and trying to make these recommendations, uh, especially when we get a recommendation from a county department that um, we're supposed to have 100% faith in and, and then turn around and go against them. But I think there's a good argument against the, uh, the original deed and deed restrictions. I wish I had my computer because I would be on Google Earth right now and, and giving some examples, but I can do it off of my phone. And that's, for instance, Dundas Road, paved. But then when I turn off on Elk Creek Road, no. it's not paved. And, and I know that some people move on to a paved road because that's their, um, that's their ideal of what they want their neighborhood to be. I have a friend that lives on Elk Creek Road because it, they feel like they're out in the back country on, you know what I'm saying, that they are living there because it's not a paved road. And, and that was part of their pull to that community because it was a private country type road. And we have lots of people in this community that do this. I mean you know, let's go to Rock Creek and we can drive down Rock Creek. Are we gonna do an infill and require someone in Rock Creek to pave their road? 
you know, if I go back up off of uh, low divide, am I going to have people building houses back in there in a subdivision and require those roads to be paved? And I recognize that this is, this is an urban road, um, but it's not within our urban sphere of influence, so it doesn't, it doesn't take me down to that conclusion. So for me, I recognize that this is a problem, and I know that um, for me, I'm, gonna, I'm going to err on the side of property rights and the, on the side of if there's not a recorded if there's not a recorded agreement on a piece of property when it's purchased, then that, rec that has to then become part of the neighborhood culture or when the neighbors get to know the new landowners and they say, would you want to become part of our agreement? And that kind of discussion starts happening, but it's not the government reach to that for a neighborhood agreement. So I would... Um, If I can just say one other thing that, I mean, I, you know, I live very close to the um, other side of Pine Grove Road. Um, my, my end is, is paved, but the, the largest portion of Pine Grove is not paved. Scott Lane, uh, Lynch, I mean, there are, I mean, you could lose a vehicle at some point yeah. during the year on those roads that are not um, that are not maintained, and I'm certainly not suggesting that this particular piece is going to have the traffic that those do. And um, it, it does concern me a little bit, though, that uh, that that you're not willing um, to put in as part of the benefit uh, of of you being able. I mean, a selling point of this particular property is that it's going to be a paved road to it, and that you're not willing to put in. Um, your share, Bob. That bothers just bothers me a little bit. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I would force you into doing it, but it sure seems like it would be something that, that you would uh, feel somewhat of an obligation to do. Um, I, I have a real concern with that, that that you're gaining the benefit of of the agreement that Mr. Baggett is involved with, um, even though it didn't say pavement; it only said four inches of gravel, 16 feet wide. So. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. I don't know if it means anything. I'm just blabbering. Do I have a motion? You just turned your mic off. I'm not sure what I mean. I, um, I, I guess I move that we... Um, accept the modification of the road improvement from of the property owner. I'm, I'm not sure that's probably county council, because the, the recommendation is to deny the request for modification. So I, my motion would be to accept the request of modification, but I'm, not, I'm arguing that the modification to the road improvement standard is not, it's not what's at issue here because I believe that that property subdivision did not have that standard applied to it. And I, I agree that on our last page where it makes reference to, I've ripped up all my papers at this point, where it makes reference to that it will act as a guide, but it's only as a guide, it's not as a requirement Therefore, I don't believe it's actually, it's actually a standard that is part of this permit. I'm, okay, <coughs> just to make sure I understand. What, what you're basically wanting to do is not require the pavement of the road. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Okay. So... I want it to meet the regular road standards. I've lost that page where it's what, the part that Tina read to us. Are you talking about the one that's used as a guide? Yes, the very short one that was at the end of our packet. 12.05.040, it says okay. that new roads shall be used as a guide. Yes, Okay. 
And so that, to me, it, 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 there's the assumption that that is the, that is the road standard to be applied to this property, and it can act as a guide. But when I read the other one, I believe it's for new development, for new subdivisions. Okay. So that's where I'm conflicted as to what kind of, what the motion should be in relationship to. I don't want to, I want to require them to meet the current road standards of the 20 feet, I don't have them memorized, of the, the width and the thickness of the size and the compaction of the gravel. So basically all of the condition 18 except for the requirement to pave the road. Correct. Okay. Well, I think what you would be doing then is you'd be granting basically their appeal and that you are going to um, accept all of condition 18 but remove the requirement for the paving, and I think that's kind of what your motion needs to reflect. So I move that we accept the appeal and remove the language of paving from, from uh, requirement number 18. I'm gonna reluctantly second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor McNamer? Yes. Okay. We can mark the bag. Now, now we can take a break. I can take back we over. Can take Do you mind? No, no, no. Do you guys want to take a break? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll take a two-minute break. Listening, you guys just took a break for 45 minutes. Well, I did. <laughs> What's this? Why is this on all of Oh, that. By the way, would you get the seated on all rods? Belongs to Mr. Baggett.
when the agenda. I move to approve uh, budget transfer 0703 and budget transfer 0801. Second. It's been moved and second. Any public comment on the budget transfers? Okay, seeing no public and uh, public comment, I'll bring it back to the board. Joey, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor McNamer? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Chair Sullivan? Yes. Passes unanimously. On to item 16, general government. Adopt an official version of the county seal as recommended by the Director of Information Technology. Mr. McCorkle, do you want to <laughs> give us a very brief presentation on the county seal? Where is Waldo? Very brief. You should have these four versions in front of you. One's a black and white. The other three are color, and they are various versions that have been used over the years. I think the more common one and the one that's been used more frequently is the one with the yellow, the yellow, yellow board. board. And as I've done a little research on it, I don't know the time frame on all these, and I know somewhere where we got them, but the yellow one's important, I guess, for, for duplicating purposes. When I went to the printers to order letterhead and see what it would cost to do the other ones, the single color of that yellow is, is easier to reproduce and cheaper to get your letterhead than it is if you were to go with some of the yellow ones. Now, they weren't able to give me pricing, so I don't know what that difference is, but if I were to give you a recommendation, it would be um, with that single color. And that one's currently on our letterhead, right? Yes. And you also wanted to adopt the black and white? I think it would be good to just, or we just allow us to use the black and white one when necessary. To have the same look. Okay. What does that one look like behind the screen? Well, that uh, one is, that's that, the color well, that was one. an interpretation, so you, you, the right. artist did sign it. Um, it doesn't look like that. I believe it has a, it has a different look. I believe it has a different lighthouse. I like three. The one on the front of the Flint three Center is the, is the blue one. So, okay, I'll entertain. We're going to have a variety. Of I move that we use uh, image three and image one as the black and white. It's the brown one. Yep. The one of the yeah. That's but, been moved. But then we've got two colors instead of one. Hey, I heard the presentation. <laughs> uh -huh. I had disagreed with staff twice now. <laughs> well, I didn't get to give any input. Well, there's not uh, a second. So. There's no second. It's uh, they only have a, yeah. a motion. Oh. Yeah. Uh, to tell you the truth, I preferred the color one, the, the all color one. I realized the cost is so much more, but I don't know if anybody else knows the big difference. The lighthouse shows rising above the horizon behind it, and on this one, it doesn't. And I think it does look much better with it on the horizon. And those don't look like redwood trees, so. So even though I preferred that colored one, I'm going to say I, I don't want the those colored look like one trees for those two particular reasons. So, so do we have a second? One negative. <laughs> so well, you know, let's not make this an hour. Well, <laughs> you know, it really is like, like where's Waldo? Uh -huh. What we've talked about before is not to have an Oregon or a Washington or an East Coast lighthouse, but to make it more Point St. George, like right. in number four. Yeah. But you got the cypress trees instead of redwoods in number four. Right. So there's a lot wrong with number four, and the lighthouse does look better and up, in, the up on the, uh, in the horizon. Um, the only thing I, I, and I don't like number three because of the darkness and the blend of the color. You can't even see the guy right. um, and, the, and the lighthouse. So if somehow you can put the Point St. George instead of the Barber Pole Lighthouse and so the recommendation of staff to go back and redesign it? Well, I like the clarity of, of uh, and then also I'm going to throw out to you, do you want established in 1857 or just 1857? So, yeah. you know, so I would do the lighthouse, make a decision on established. I think established. Or make them redwood trees. Looks better. You know, but yeah, the number, number four is out um, because it just is. I mean, there's too many things missing. The rope between the donkeys, the color of the guy's coat, the <laughs> location of the lighthouse, the trees, the topography. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the inside of one, two, or three are all the same, and the only thing I'd recommend is changing the lighthouse. And established. Well, I think, 
the stablish looks probably better than I mean that's a that's a call I, I would be willing to do the same and and choose image number two just because of the cost factor and but I would like to see it be Point St. George Lighthouse rather than right. um, the barber pole and I would like to see it say established 1857 so we're actually, I think, without a second on Supervisor Hemmingson's motion, we're sending it. No, I think we're sending it back to staff to include okay. those recommendations and come back with uh, come back with a, a couple choices. So four is out completely. Mm -hmm. Don't bring that back before the board. <laughs> that, that's gone. <laughs> yeah, except use the lighthouse in number four. I believe number four is on the, is on the courthouse right now. Well, we can repaint it. We don't know. I know. So yeah, I, I think we're fine now. Um, well, that's I think we understand tile, the direction. They? It was a uh, yeah. It yeah. was some kind well, of. And it's I hard to make a redwood in tile. Yes. <laughs> I guess I don't know. <laughs> I think we understand your direction, and we can come back with a few options with some different yeah. colors, but we'll keep the uh, keep to the proper lighthouse, I, I the proper you, trees. You got the gist of why we're here, is because that seal is yes. different than the ones on the courthouse. I have two separate business cards with yes. two different seals. Jay has about six. Yes, I know. <laughs> Jay has a, a very good representation in his office of the different ones that have come about. Of the iteration. But on our I think the idea would be yes. having one with some color and one as black and white makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yes. So. And I, I do believe that the two should be consistent whether it's 1857 or established 1857. Yeah. I think established 1857 makes mm -hmm. sense. I don't really like that. What was the original seal, <laughs> the black and white one? No, I, I, I'm, I'm only guessing. I believe it's, it's the number two. I believe image two is the one I've, I've seen most often. So the original one didn't even have the established one? Well, I'd like to go. I don't, I don't know for sure. I can do you know, some more research on that. We could probably ask the Historical I Society to do some research for go. us and right. find the original seal. Then we'll find out what we want to change. <laughs> Make the light again. Okay, that's fine. So, direction from the board then is to come back with some alternatives and research. And research. Okay, going on to item 17. Mr. McCorkle's up there already. So, director presentation by the director of information technology regarding ongoing and recently completed technology related project for the county of Del Norte. Do you, want to do, do you want to do it from the Gosh. from the desk or for your request at a couple couple of meetings ago we we put together a little uh, PowerPoint of some of the projects we've been working on lately um, probably one of the most recent ones we've done is migrated all county employees over to the Google Apps um, platform. We've moved all their email off of a Novell system we were using. We had that Novell system for about 15 years, um, countywide for about 10 years. Uh, the, the migration went very well. It was uh, almost 400 email accounts, uh, over a million emails. Um, IT staff did the entire um, migration in-house, um, and we did all the training, and we currently support it. Uh, we switched because uh, Google is, is easier for us to maintain. Basically, Google Google's maintaining it. We can just add the usernames. Um, disaster recovery is built into it. We had to manage that ourselves before, and when we got a lot of emails, it was it was cumbersome to try to manage that. Um, Google has more features than we had before, and we're just starting to get into those features now. Uh, document collaboration. Uh, they provide training online, so we can just direct employees to go to those trainings. It does the archiving for us. Where that, that was a big process for us to manage. Um, encrypting email uh, was troublesome before. With Google, it's very easy. There is some dollar savings, but it's not um, it's not dramatic, and it'll we'll, we will see savings over time. You'll see some few funny clips as we go through on these slides. Uh, other projects we've been working on is network upgrades. This is not our server room, but we did find a our server room has looked like this at times, but clean now. But you did find an employee in there? We did find an employee. And <laughs> Calvin's with us now in the back here, so we pulled him out of there. <laughs> um, this image here represents our, our wireless network, or most of our wireless network. We've been doing wireless 
uh, connectivity between our buildings for about 10 years now. Um, it's, if you look at over the 10 years, uh, the amount of money we've saved, not having to lease lines from a phone company or, the, or charter, um, it's a tremendous amount of savings. A lot of other counties ask us, you know, they weren't able to do this and there. They, they pay for a lot of lease lines. It's a huge expense with a lot of counties. We, in our county right now, only has one leased data line that we pay for from um, Frontier now. Um, most counties find that amazing. There's some other data lines that come in, but they're state data lines for state projects. The county, we, we don't have to maintain any. We, we do them all with these wireless projects. This is the same map just showing all the, all the connections south. So right here is the Flynn Center. You'll see we go over to the Veterans Hall, um, Sheriff's Office, and all of our points south. This one here is when I took the image, uh, we were working on this. This is the K Street facility uh, where mental health and some administrative um, employees are. That link was down on that day, so this is one of the maps that we can see. And when those links go down, we get notified and we can see that information. That link is back up today. So. And then going north, we actually uh, lease space on top of a uh, building at the fairgrounds where we have a tower there. And from there, we can rebroadcast to places that don't have line of sight to the Flynn Center. So over the road department, social services, um, on Birchall Street, we have a facility. And then over towards the old mental health facility is where we go here. There's a lot of trees here, so we can't get to Juvenile Hall. So we use a different solution for Juvenile Hall. So the green is a different signal, different uh I, I'm not Better sure signal, the different color signal. signal. I, it's the speed of the connection. Okay. Uh, Calvin, he's in the back now, but he, he loves grass and, and all the stuff he provides us. He sets up all of our network monitoring. Um, if a server goes down, if any of our connections go down, we all get emailed, but we can go to these screens, whether we're in our office or at home at night, we can see what's going on with the network. This is an example of one screen where it would scroll down forever and you'd see all the various servers, routers, um, switches that we have. Um, another one, these are two of about probably 100 graphs that he set up. Um, so they're just examples. One shows our, our state router that we have over at social services and the connection that goes out there. It's important that we monitor them. Um, when people report problems, we need to see what the traffic is, um, if they're overusing it. The one here at the bottom would represent our overall internet traffic or traffic that goes through our routers over here at the Flynn Center. Um, comes in very handy sometimes when things slow down, we can look and there might be an issue of virus out there or somebody trying to um, get into our servers and, and Calvin's quick to point those out and get them corrected. Video broadcasting, that has changed. That last image there is what we're trying to get I, Sylvia to use so she can nice broadcast helmet. your meetings. Good helmet. She's refusing so far, but we'll work on her. <laughs> Um, so we're broadcasting live on Ustream. That process is working very well for us. Um, it's, it's saving us money. We don't have to maintain servers. Um, we didn't have to buy any new equipment. Um, and uh, it's a universally used system. So anybody with their iPads, droids, or whatever device they're using can go to Ustream and look at the videos. Um, we also stream live on Facebook. It's just a link on Facebook that points to Ustream. But it, if you're in Facebook, it will show up and people can view it. Um, YouTube, we archive our videos. Uh, we see more and more counties, more and more cities are doing that. So we're jumping on the bandwagon. They let you have it there for free. And we're all about that. And it, again, it's a universal platform. Anybody can go with any of their devices. <coughs> and we don't have to worry about upgrading these systems. The video system we had before was probably six or seven years old. Uh, it had never been upgraded. And you could all really only do it with Windows machines. So this is a lot better system for us for no cost. We've been working with Humboldt, Humboldt County Public Access. So it's Access Humboldt, or Ac yeah, Access Humboldt is the name of their organization. It's a nonprofit. Profit. They run four public access television channels in Humboldt County. They came up, looked at our stuff. We've met with them a few times down at broadband meetings in Humboldt County, and, and they've offered us a lot of information. And, they're always looking for ways to fill their channels, so they ran a test with us when we switched to Ustream. 
to see if the quality of our video would work on their channels. And they have done a couple of test ones, actually broadcasted your previous meeting, the entire meeting live there. And um, it went out to everybody in Humboldt County um, just fine. They had no issues. They had several people out there watching it to verify, and it works just fine. They are more advanced than the equipment we have here in Del Mar County, but they are working with the school district and Tim Hoon at Rural Human Services on some projects here, and they have offered any assistance we want in getting um, the local public access channel up to speed so that they can do similar stuff with us and just pull our feeds off the internet and not have to worry about running fiber lines to their buildings or, or other things that have been preventing us from doing this in the past. So. Ironically, it looks like we have the opportunity and they're going to send us a little more information about broadcasting live in Humboldt County before we can broadcast live on public access in Delmar County. But um, it's great that they have all that um, knowledge there and are willing to help us out. Uh, currently, we broadcast to board supervisors and city council solid waste management. We're looking for other people that want to do it. We can't do it for free, so we do charge anywhere from 20 to 25 per hour for the broadcasting services. Um, we think that's pretty cheap, and we would like some other agencies to jump on board. System is pretty flexible since we put together this slide, the one image at the bottom right of your screen, right down here. It, it died yesterday. That was the range of the system, but because we're using Ustream, it was easier for us to adapt to some older um, equipment we had in our back room. So we were able to do this presentation um, with that equipment. And it makes it much easier if we travel too, which the traveling can be somewhat cumbersome for us trying to set this up, but it should be much easier now. The details on these aren't uh, necessarily too important to you right now, but we can get a lot of statistics on your broadcasting. This is YouTube, so it would be uh, statistics based on who went back and looked at the archive videos. Um, and this is over since we started going to YouTube, and I think it's 170 <coughs> sometimes the video was watched. Um, it kind of gives us some demographics about where it was, and you could drill in on some of these and see oh, who the customers are that's watching them. But it gives you a good idea that there's people, you know, even though there's not a lot of people in here right now, you're going to see that there are people that go out and watch these, these um, shows. This is from Ustream, so it's a representation of the live video feed. In the last two meetings, the previous two meetings before this, you had at least 25 people watching live, and those are unique people, a unique stream. So it's not one person doing it at multiple times. Um, so you know, even though you might not have here, you got to picture 25 more people out there watching this this meeting. And I think that's a, a reason right there to continue with this project. I think this is a very good project, and we're reaching quite a few people. The one peak here was the first broadcast we did. And we told a lot of people to go out there. We were testing it, so you can't really use that at high peak. Uh, other projects we're working on, we're putting Wi-Fi into all, well, most of the county facilities. Um, we keep running into issues where outside vendors come in or even employees with their devices, and they want to be able to use their devices, whether it's phones or, or whatever. Um, it's becoming more and more important. So we've already outfitted the Flint Center. There's a couple of dead spots. Joey's office is one of them. So I can't say we're done at the Flint Center because he's sitting right next to me. Um, but we've got to fix that. We've uh, done projects at the airport, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, Crescent Fire and Health and Human Services over at K Street is complete. Um, by the end of this fiscal year, we'll have completed um, the rest of Health and Human Services, Sheriff's Department Veterans Hall, which is good for all their events that they have there, um, probation, district attorney, and we also have a project that will be funded by emergency um, OES that will fund uh, providing Wi-Fi at the fairgrounds. Um, we'll be able to allow the public to use it for their events. The fairgrounds will see, receive a benefit, and then that signal will be there for when um, emergency services needs it, and they do a lot of staging at that facility. Um, the Wi-Fi we have is, I already said, good for employees and guests when they come in. The Wi-Fi is on a separate network. There's no security risk to our network. Even though it travels alongside our stuff, there's no integration between them. So anybody on the public side, there's no way just to log in or get to the county network. Um, then depending on the site we're at, um, in this building, it's, there's no passwords to get onto it. Some of the other buildings we had to put passwords because we're in a lease building with other tenants and we can't properly do that. We're, we, it's 
basically providing a charter account to everybody else in the building for free, and that's not uh, polite. Airport improvements. We airport had some issues with security out there, and plus we were have always been dealing with Wi-Fi out there, so we um, we did not install this camera. As, as an I was going to say it's in the back of the monitor, so the view is yeah. not going to be that. We prefer great, the I signs. Guess. We think the signs would work just fine. But uh, we improved the wireless connectivity out there. It wasn't on your map because it was a different system. They're a little bit hard to get. There's a lot of trees in the way, but we um, uh, Calvin and Maurice did a lot of research and. Uh, found the proper wireless, and even though we had signal out there, we put new equipment out there, got a lot better signal. Um, with that, we ended up putting security cameras out at the airport. Um, we're still testing these cameras. We put a lot of cheap cameras in different spots just so they could get a view of what we're doing, and we'll build out from there, but um, they're able to manage all this stuff on site there. Plus, they can get internet access. Um, there's Wi-Fi all in the terminal building, and. It, the grounds around the terminal building also have the Wi-Fi. We've also spread it, spread it out to some of the buildings that are out there. Uh, Charter gave bids to provide internet out there of $80,000. Um, and mainly that's because they have to trench to get out there. So Charter's online and everybody's online when there's airport improvements and those roads are opened up, that they'll be on board there to, to put their lines out there and be able to sell services to uh, companies that want to open up out there. You'll see an uh, image from the water tower. This one, uh, the salt water apparently collects on the camera, so we have problems keeping this one clean, and it gets blurry quite a bit. Um, the parking lot. Uh, you wanted the, the gated area so they can see who's going in and out of the gated areas. Uh, the terminal building, there's been a lot of activity around there, and then we do have extra security we hired here. This, this bird was caught on camera. So. Um, emergency operations center Crescent Fire. That's not Crescent Fire there, but somebody gave me that photo. Um, we had grants last year from the EOC to, uh, to improve the EOC, and the EOC is at Crescent Fire. So we, the IT part of it was we installed eight televisions, two projectors, a bunch of computers, and a very big dry erase board, and some media controls to kind of make that a uh, work good for an emergency operations center, plus a training room. And you'll see some pictures of the room. This is the, the front conference room at the fire hall. Uh, this is the meeting room outside of the chief's office over there. Um, and of course, every time we're over there, they do what? Board meetings, so we got pictures of that. The computers down here are, sta are examples of the EOC computers. They're set up and ready to go and can be moved into place when needed. Are they used? No, our, our agreement with them now is that the, there's specific ones for the EOC. There's six specific ones for the EOC. And although there's a couple firefighters that will use them, because we want them to be turned on and used, but we don't want stuff installed on them. So those are, those are real specific, so a limited number of people. Um, we're trying to make an arrangement with them, and we're very close with an MOU to bring to you that will allow us to bring over more computers that we can use for trainings, um, and that also the fire hall can use as, as an agreement. But these specific ones, no, we need to keep them ready for EOC. And we're, we never seem to get notice of disasters, so we need them to work. And if we let other people use them, they won't. Uh, this image is a image of the, the larger room they have. And I'll go and see a couple different ones. This is that large room, and that's a 30-foot dry erase board magnetic. Um, it has a projector above it where they can project, and then right on top of that, um, they can also, it's magnetic, so they can um, post, there's boards and stuff that they post up, little forms and stuff that they can put up on this dry erase board. They seem to really love this feature. Uh, it is really nice. It was not easy to install. Um, and then the bottom right, there's uh, three TVs also that sit in there. And it's a different part of the meeting. You'll see the last one we took that picture. This media center is almost complete. This box down in the bottom left controls all the TVs. So if somebody wants to do a PowerPoint or display TV or DVD or whatever we're trying to look at, we can control it from one spot. So out of the eight TVs in the building, we can control all of those eight TVs from this one spot, uh, display that PowerPoint on all the different um, locations. Uh, 
as I said before, working on MOU with them that we'll be able to use the facility for more um, than just EOC that we can use as a training center. We've been looking at a training center. We had one set up briefly at the top of the manual arts building and then had to shut that down after the fire um, and some other issues that came up over there. So we've been looking for a place to do the training. Crescent Fire is a great solution. They have a nice clean building with a lot of, they have kitchen facilities, they have generators. Um, it benefited them to have trainings. If they could jump in on trainings, they were willing to do this. Uh, so it's a good fit for us. And plus, we have all these upgrades with the EOC, and, it, and everything fit well over there. I want to talk about the staff a little bit. Sylvia, I think, ran away. She has, uh, she takes classes over at CR, so she had to run away to that. But Sylvia does great with our video printing career. She's doing tech support. She's keeping busy. It used to be she had to come up and ask us for stuff to do. That hasn't happened in months. Um, we're keeping her very busy. Donald Roth is over at the sheriff's office, does a great job for us over there. Um, you can imagine the sheriff's office can be difficult, a lot of different systems, and they need everything immediately, of course. Uh, Calvin is back here, not enjoying doing the video stuff right now, I'm sure. It's a little bit new to him, but he does a great job for us, tech support. Um, the routers and servers, he maintains those, programming those routers, trying to get all this connectivity to work. Um, Maurice, he's, he does a lot of my research for me. When we look at these new antennas, uh, look at which router we have to get. Um, software applications, when new applications come up, we have to work, um, see if it works for our, in our systems. Carla Allen is over at Health and Human Services. We used to have two employees stationed over there full time. And I think two years ago, we cut back on that. Uh, Carla is over there all by herself over at the 880 Northcrest location. There's a lot of employees over there and she does a tremendous job keeping all that stuff straight. We could probably take the rest of the county and all the systems that the county has in general, and then social services, health, TUP, all the various things that they do over there. There's a, a bunch of systems over there, and there's a lot to maintain. And the state doesn't make it any easier when they, when they implement a new program. We're going through one now. Um, we have one printer and one computer. Well, they, they implement LA County, and we have the same process that they do. It's the same, it drags on for a year. It's the same requirements they do, the same documentation, and, and they're doing thousands of computers. Um, so Carla does a great job um, keeping all that straight, and, and she's very well respected over there. Rachel is our only GIS staff person. She does, uh, CDD comes to her quite a bit for projects. I know she's doing a mine project right now. Um, she maintains the GIS parcel layer for the assessor's office, so the assessor does their splits manually still and provides that information over to Rachel and she keeps the digital side up to date. And then she also takes on other tasks, of course, and she uh, did a tremendous amount of the Google implementation, the training and getting people switched over to that and managing that. Um, and she's doing another one with probation right now. Alan is the assistant department head. He oversees all the department stuff. He goes out to the other departments, um, seeing what their needs are. He does a lot of the legacy programming. We still have an AS400, which we don't have a lot of county systems on it, but we have a couple, so it's an older system that we have to maintain. And we actually still may maintain it for the courts as well. We're looking forward to giving that to them someday. And um, he coordinates a lot of the projects, the wireless, getting up on these buildings, making sure we have all the equipment we need to make this wireless project stay together. It's, uh, What's the legacy program? Old. Old programs. So. When you look at the AS400, it, it was, that was the main system for the county a long time ago, uh, 12 years ago, it would be the main system. Um, it still runs some of the same programs. It runs the court system, it runs probations in, in the middle of switching out of it. Sheriff's Department still uses it a little bit. Um, I believe community development, hopefully they're done with it now, but it's, they're older systems that he was involved with when, um, many years ago that we still have that we never bothered to learn because we thought they would be going away but they just keep holding on, so. Um, stuff that's coming up next, we'll continue on the Google Apps. We think there's a lot of benefit in the Google Apps beyond the email, the document collaboration, um, the calendaring, the, the websites it can create, all that stuff we think can have a huge benefit to the county. Uh, the more we can switch off and get away from the expensive Microsoft products and either go to Google or there's other free versions of the Microsoft products, it's, it's just a plus to the county. 
Um, I strongly believe that moving to the cloud technology, Google is a cloud technology, our stuff is, is technically stored in several data centers. We don't te technically know where we're retrieving this data from, that is what the cloud would be. Um, there's other services and as our bandwidth becomes better in our county and Charter is offering us a lot of high speed bandwidth now, um, being able to move all of our data off to the cloud would be a, a goal of mine. It can't happen in the next couple of years and be over time. But just having it all out there and having large companies maintain it, whether it's Amazon or Google or there's, there's large companies that do this, um, they have millions of other customers and they're going to maintain it at a higher level than we can. They're going to buy more expensive stuff, they're going to buy top of the line stuff and they'll be required to keep it um, stuff running um, better than we can here. I think that's just an inevitable thing that's going to happen. Uh, more and more people are moving to it and I think it's, uh, it's the direction I want to take the county to. Thin clients are basically getting rid of these bulkier computers and basically you have a monitor keyboard on your desk and it's collect, uh, connecting out to the cloud and, and getting all your data out there. So we don't have this, this computer sitting here. It's important because they're, first they're more expensive and they draw about 10 times as much power as the thin client too. So when, as we're moving forward and everybody's worried about power consumption, you know, we're a small county so 400 computers, you drop that, it, it would make a, we'd, we'd see a difference and it wouldn't be huge. but. Um, you know, it's where everybody's moving to and we think it's important too. Also easier for us to maintain. And then the other thing which Joey loves when I bring out is the, uh, the remote workforce. Um, we've talked about it for a while and I think it's something the county should continue on and I'll keep researching, but private companies quite frequently allow their employees to work from home, uh, re work remotely. It's not as common with governments. Um, government has a tendency to want to be in the building and have the point of pre presence when the public comes in, there's a spot to see them. Um, but I think this can benefit Donner County, not that 100% of your employees can work from home. Um, but if it's a benefit that you can offer to employees uh, to help recruit employees and it's beneficial to the county, you can get the same job done doing that. I think it's something the county should look into and I'll continue to work with Joey and Jay and on options for this. It's not something that's going to happen right away, but I think it's something that could benefit the county. Right. Yeah, I don't think so. That's not for us. No. Nice. Uh, Any questions? We are working on getting rid of those binders, if you want to. Yeah. They're heavy before I take reading on the computer. Getting I don't, want, I don't want to give you a date, but we're getting closer. We have some new software that we're doing in-house to handle some of the agenda management instead of trying to upgrade the existing software, which they're charging a lot. And we're, we're, we're testing them. So it would be more like Adobe then or PDF? They'll be, they'll be an Adobe version. We can already do that. But we also need to provide some HTML or some web-based versions of it too to make it easier on the, on the, uh, the iPads. And yeah, the, the system right now is chunky. Best yeah. way I can describe it. It is, and we are on an old system, so we could upgrade. But you know, do we want to put that money into that, or it's a lot of money to upgrade some of these systems. So, okay. Any other questions, comments from supervisors? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Okay, uh, we are going to move on to the number 18. Accept the draft administrative policies and procedures manual. Provide any comments and corrections, and direct staff to make any corrections and return the document. At a future meeting for adoption as requested by the county administrative officer. Jay. Uh, this project's been underway for many years, trying to consolidate all of the policies and procedures of the county in one manual in order to assist our staff and uh, be able to be more efficient at dealing with some issues that come up and there are questions. A lot of times if there are administrative questions, they call our office. We then do the research because it's not something we do every day all of these policies are not enacted on every you know every day um, and then there's uh, other policies that are an everyday uh, occurrence and new employees and employees that don't work on those projects continually will have to refer back well this manual is uh, intended to be that source of information that people can review first hopefully get their answers and then if they need clarification they can call administration and we will either answer their questions or put them in touch with the department that 
um, can answer their questions because a lot of these policies include administrative procedures but also include policies for accounting and purchasing and IT and ultimately this will all be online uh, where uh, some of these policies uh, in, in their entirety will be links so that you can actually refer to those online. Uh, you don't have to have uh, multiple hard copies in order to do your research. Um, like I said, it, it, this project has been ongoing for many years. We have an existing administrative procedures manual, but it's not a, as encompassing as this. Um, I can tell you that I know Joey has worked on this, I've worked on this, and Barbara Drew is now working on this. <laughs> and it goes back about four staff people before Joey. So uh, this project has been in between everything else and we're trying to consolidate it. And today what we'd like to do is present it to you, have you go through it over a period of a couple of weeks, um, see if there's anything glaring in there policy-wise that we need to bring back, maybe make some amendments, and uh, ultimately get this adopted so that we can then make it available to all the employees and department heads. So well, you're not looking for recommendations today, you're just over I'm the not. next couple of weeks? Okay. No, I, I did not want to drop this on the board and say, okay, I need a decision today. This some is something- page, page numbers would be good start. This needs to be reviewed. And so it's taken uh, uh, quite a few different iterations through software changes also through IT because over the years uh, that's changed also, but now I, I believe we've got everything under control so we can make changes that doesn't change formatting that can then also uh, be put online pretty quickly. So it, what I'd like today is to present it to you and make it available and then if, take any questions over time, we'll make those changes and ultimately bring back a final document. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so we'll get back to I you. I can tell you that I was surprised to see the reimbursement rate for lodging. That one will change, and it will change <laughs> annually, whatever uh, comes through the IRS rates, and our rates are reflective of uh, the state rates, but are also quite state low. State rates are 89. Yeah, we, ours, are, ours uh, <laughs> give us some flexibility because of uh, the ability, you know, our travel is typically going to put you in uh, some of the hotels that are around the conferences, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so our rate is not high, but it is higher than the state's. Our, uh, we, you know, the policies also include in here, you know, we have a travel policy and um, we'll have references to, uh, through the MOU, there are going to be uh, other references that employees will be able to look up that are actually negotiated. So there's gonna be a combination of documents, but this should put everything I think it's really nice. <coughs> into one, one document that we can refer to. Okay, well done. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move on to number 19. Uh, receive a verbal report from Supervisor Finnegan regarding the actions of the Redevelopment Oversight Committee. I will try to keep this brief. What this came from was a, some sort of remark from the mayor at the last joint meeting that maybe you weren't informed as to what goes on. Rather than at that meeting when we're trying to get along, I didn't wanna say, well, it's the fox guarding the hen house. Um, to, so what happened is this, the, the oversight meeting is the RDA oversight is actually when the redevelopment agencies were done away with by the governor um, and, and by the legislature, there were successor agencies that were appointed. And, in, and then there's this oversight board that makes sure the successor agency is doing what they're supposed to do. And the successor agency was supposed to validate some of the contracts that came before prevent new contracts or abridgments to those contracts and liquidate the assets of those redevelopment agencies that were terminated. In the case of Crescent City, as in with a lot throughout California, is the successor agency actually was the same body that was sitting as the redevelopment agency, hence the fox watching the hen house. So the first meeting, uh, I guess I should go back a little bit. The, the redevelopment agencies were supposed to be an economic development tool and a portion of it was to go to low-income housing and the rest was to go towards economic development to cure blighted areas, uh, as well as to allow for uh, business development, as well as to allow for economic development and low-income housing. And to that end, there was a base light set on your property taxes and as the t property taxes increased, that increase was then given to the redevelopment agencies for those purposes to help development um, for housing or to help development of businesses to 
then bring the entire tax structure up, and then it would start feeding itself. Okay? The litmus test probably should have been, and this was an area that got grayed over the areas uh, over the years, and I think being the mayor of Oakland, the governor was well aware of what was being done, uh, and that's why he went after him, is this tax increment that was then no longer being passed to the city and the county per se, but definitely the county, the special districts, the school districts, the hospital district, library, harbor, et cetera, went to the redevelopment agency for the intended purpose. The litmus test for that intended purpose was that if you're investing in a property that is public, then it's not going to raise the property tax value. Okay, so that's, that probably shouldn't happen if you want to be a little skeptical about it. And that's what the area of some of these redevelopment agencies, what they were doing. In Riverside County, they um, used the money to build new football stadiums. And they argued, oh, look at all the people that went there and it was great for economic development, the community felt good. It did not increase the taxes. Now they could say that maybe the houses appreciated in value because you had a nice football stadium two blocks away. That's really graying the issue. Locally, we have that graying of the issue with the pool. They keep saying, well, you know, we got this pool and that's economic development. It doesn't increase the tax structure. The saying that the house on the Barisa track is worth more because there's a pool downtown is really graying the issue. You know, so I don't want to get into that too much of those philosophical discussions, other than to say some of the money that they spent, um, which was prior to the cutoff of no, 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 don't do that anymore, was well spent in investing in businesses like Pelican Bay Travel, the El Patio Hotel, curing blighted areas, uh, the Surfside uh, Grill down there, trying to help them get back on their feet. So, but they also did things like repairing the police department, repairing City Hall, buying themselves a building uh, for the housing authority, uh, things like that. So when the successor agency was formed, the successor agency then took possession of those assets and was supposed to liquidate them. Now, there was a drop dead date when the governor tried to kill the redevelopment agencies. It was appealed, the city's lost every single time. Um, and then, of course, they're going to continue to sue. But while that was going on, also the legislation changed as to what was allowable. When it first happened, the city was looking at potentially having to liquidate its assets, especially if they didn't become the successor agency, because they had buildings, public buildings, that they purchased with redevelopment money that really was not the intent for what it was supposed to be. That's not an issue anymore. The issue that we're dealing with now is what they call these ROPs, the repayment of the obligations. Um, what you're not supposed to do is you're not supposed to renegotiate a loan that's already out there. Well, that comes into mind that they talk about raising the water rates because they borrowed money from themselves. And that's something that redevelopment agency did. It might be a little hard to say that they laundered money to themselves, but I guess that's basically what they did. Um, so it was a way to evolve, uh, to um, avoid a bond, per se. In other words, rather than asking the voters whether they wanted to pay for a pool by going to bond, they borrowed money from themselves and they completely went around the system. Um, not only did they do that, though, but they did not have a specific note tied to that loan. So when we were asked to go ahead and repay this loan obligation for so many millions of dollars, whatever it is, um, there's no note of record. There's no interest rate that was established. There's no amortization schedule. So now they're making one up. Well, that's not right. But then you look at the makeup of that board, of this oversight board. The school is represented, but the school really has nothing to lose because they're going to get backfilled by Prop 98. The college has a um, member on it, but they're not impacted because the college doesn't get money through our local taxes, through Humboldt. Um, you have me who's representing the Board of Supervisors and also crying foul on behalf of the library district, the harbor, the fire districts and everything that are getting money that went to public use um, instead of private business or housing use that didn't go to these districts. And then you have the city manager, you have the mayor, and the head staff person is the chief financial officer for the city. What has been trying? And so I'm not ready to rubber stamp a lot of this stuff. What is trying is, and the, the auditor can speak to it, Clint, and Clint's not here, but this associate is, 
um, and I'm hoping that he'll be willing to weigh in on some of this stuff too. What has been trying is getting this information from the city. In other words, if you look at the revenue sheet, well, where are the payments from people that the redevelopment agency gave money that have to pay it back? Well, it's not there. And then we were told, well, yeah, but there's money, there's checks being cut to the city, so why should the city have to give it to the successor agency just to give pay a bill? We just paid the bill. Well, that's not right. <laughs> you know, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, when they were asked uh, by the state uh, financial uh, uh, office in January, how much money do you have on hand, the city said none. Well, we knew that we had cut them a check for 400 and some odd thousand dollars. Well, they said, well, that was already obligated. Well, it couldn't have been obligated. I mean, like, we uh, mean under the rules. We no, we mean in the county. Okay. okay. And then when they finally did show what it was obligated for, which wasn't obligated at the time, you know, they should have disclosed, yes, we have this much money on hand. I guess a new twist is that there's about $67,000 more that they have that they didn't account for spending that we're now having as the county has to ask for it back because they aren't supposed to be keeping it. So it's just, it's hard working on an oversight where there's not a lot of cooperation and understandably so because the city would have to then pony up and pay their own bills um, when they were using redevelopment money for doing just that. Now, some people may say that's a little stiff language to take, but that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, part of the little twist that took place was the original legislation said that these repayment plans had to be sanctioned by, approved by, uh, the auditor controller. Instead, the city took their plan, presented it to us, and even before they presented it to us, sent it to the Department of Finance to get the okay, um, which the Department of Finance, I guess, gave them. And then, in checking with the auditor controller, saying, and then the auditor controller comes forward and saying, hey, that's not good. I question that and I question that. Well, fortunately, I ran into um, the director of finance. Uh, and, and the one that's also handling these redevelopment things in Sacramento and said, why do you do that? And he apologized. He said, well, we're focusing on Los Angeles and some of the bigger ones and some of the smaller counties just slipped through. We will take a look at that, though. Well, what happened now is there are some obligations because of that first one that we probably shouldn't have been paying that now we have to pay that we may get penalized for. I guess what I'm saying is that this oversight, it would be nice, number one, to get all the information correctly the first time and it would also be better if we had open and honest and transparent communication between the city, the redevelopment agency, which is the city, and the auditor controller. So we know we're all getting good information. And with that, I'm gonna lead, let the auditor controller's office maybe give you a little oversight of some of the problems we may have worked our way into, keeping in mind that the legislation that governs this whole thing has been also been a moving target. John, I'm the assistant auditor controller. Uh, much as what Supervisor Finnegan has told you is exactly the case. Um, part of the problem for everybody involved is everything changing from start of what Governor Brown wanted in the process of getting rid of the redevelopment areas to what has now ended with the latest legislation of Assembly Bill 1484 and trying to understand what everybody's role is in the process of uh, who's responsible for what and what what we need to be doing. One of the things that isn't gonna change is that the county and the auditor controller's office has established a required property tax trust fund, which all of the increment that would have been uh, part of the redevelopment area is put into this so that a hierarchy is followed as far as disbursements of payments from that. Supervisor Finnegan said that uh, the city has, uh, actually the successor agency comes up with required obligation payment schedule and that is basically establishes what should be paid, what should not be paid. That information has changed from one meeting to the other. Uh, also trying to establish exactly what agreements were legitimate and which ones had official agreements in place and getting the oversight board to go with that has also been another struggle. Uh, Mr. Shad and myself, as soon as this 
the whole idea of the redevelopment agencies and areas being dissolved came into effect. There were basically two choices that looked like they were going to be made um, by bills. One, to keep the RDAs in place and basically pay what everybody was calling a ransom fee um, to the state so that the state could recoup some of the money and keep what, as long as the RDA stayed in place or the dissolving of them entirely. It ended up that keeping RDAs in place was basically thrown out, uh, ruled unconstitutional to for that to be allowed, the entire assembly bill was. So dissolving all of the redevelopment areas was was the next step. So that's what caused this last minute scramble with some of the projects that were going on with the city, including the removal of the tsunami landing and uh, a couple other little things that they had going on. Department of Finance is probably the main role of anybody taking the initiative as far as what gets reinforced, approving these required obligation payment schedules, which everybody just calls ROPs. Um, State controller's office was supposed to take a more significant role up until this point have, have not. They've let Department of Finance basically take the entire lead on that. So that is who we have been in constant communication with. The biggest issue that's going on right now as far as the last required obligation payment schedule that was approved was basically approved out of sequence of what should have happened. It should have, and at the time, uh, Mr. Shad needed to approve it, basically certify it, even though it was unclear as far as what an actual certification meant, but we took it as due diligence in, in getting backup documentation, uh, making sure that all the expenses on there were legitimate and that they met the, you know, dateline, cutoff datelines and everything like that. Then it was supposed to go in front of the uh, new oversight board so that they could approve it and agree to it. Um, there's administrative costs related to that and look at all the agreements that were in place and agree that that was something that should be paid out of this money that was coming forth out of this uh, new trust fund that was established. Then it was to be sent to the Department of Finance. Instead, in order, um, from what I understand, Supervisor Finnegan, that in order to meet a deadline, for the Department of Finance. It was actually sent to the Department of Finance prior to the Oversight Board approving it. The Department of Finance assumed that the Oversight Board had already approved it, otherwise they wouldn't be getting it, approved it, and that's the one that we have to currently work with. As far as the Department of Finance is concerned, it doesn't matter whether or not the Oversight Board did it. First, they approved it, and that's the one that we're going with. And from the money that we had paid them um, for the disbursement to the money that they had given at the last meeting that we had, there is about a $67,000 discrepancy and we're currently working on a demand letter that is going to be coming from our office, from Mr. Shad to them demanding that money back. Uh, the only clawback agreement that is basically set in place in the new legislation is that before any new monies can be dispersed from them on any of the new obligations that they come up with was be that we can withhold the amount that they owe if they don't choose to just pay us that first before we disperse any more monies to them. And that's basically get you up to speed. That's where we're at right now. The trailer bill basically eliminates the certification process for the auditor controller to actually certify, but does not necessarily take away the county's obligation as far as keeping this required you know, property tax trust fund and making sure that the hierarchy is followed as far as what gets dispersed from it. The idea of the trailer bill was so that Governor Brown dissolves the redevelopment agencies, then everybody that was affected by the redevelopment areas basically sat back and said, where's my money? These redevelopment areas aren't in place anymore, where's my money? Well, all of the RDAs and the successor agencies have so much obligations out there that basically all the money that's getting dispersed from them is basically paying current bond payments or current obligations. And so none of this money is getting back to the intended parties in which it was supposed to, unless they had negotiated pass-through agreements prior to the dissolving of these agencies. So that's where we're at with that. and. We're still going to stay very involved in it, whether or not it requires an official certification from our office or not. Uh, it's something that 
you know, Clinton has read in very much detail and is very knowledgeable about the specifics. Um, I've researched about every single branch of the health and safety code in relation to it, and we took a very serious approach to it that this was an extra responsibility that the, you know, the taxpayers were putting on us, and, you know, we were not going to spend more money hiring consultants and, uh, you know, additional legal fees and all that. It, you know, we just gave it a very good read, and it's been the hardest part in the communication with you know, on the city's behalf is that everything from them is coming from, they have to run it through their consultants first, and we've been in disagreement with a lot of the information that the consultants are passing on to them or how it's being presented to us. My biggest frustration is the timeline in which it's being presented to us. It's changes in a handout five minutes before a meeting and stuff like that, and it makes it hard when we're in the forum to discuss it to basically be able to discuss it when you've only had a couple of minutes in order to research the, the change in the numbers or the information. So hopefully we're gonna work towards solving some of those issues so that we get on the same page as far as like what's going to be an approved agreement, you know, where exactly are your loans, you know, and what are the established rates, you know, for how you did the pool improvements, you know, as far as you borrowed from your own water fund, you know, reserves and not the county's not in a position, neither is the auditor's office, of trying to put them, of, of them not getting their money back. It's just present us the information and give us the actual agreements and how it happened so that we can see by the rates, establish the right hierarchy, make sure everybody gets paid back in the way that the legislation asks them to be paid back. And is the pool loan the only loan? Uh, the pool loan was divided into two different loans, but it seems as though now they've consolidated it all into one single loan from their water fund right now. They also have had other loans in which they have loaned out to projects, uh, redevelopment area projects. Um, that the money coming back from those, those loans are supposed to be paid back. We are still having not, not a whole lot of clarification on that. They're supposed to come back to that trust or to that same pot of money. Well, the, the money that's being paid back for that the city had loaned out on redevelopment projects doesn't necessarily come back to that um, required property trust. It can go back into their general fund? I don't think it should be going back into their general fund. We're just having a hard time getting a clear accounting of where those funds are actually coming in and where they are going. That's, that's what we just want to see. We just want to see how much money that they're actually working with and to go from being told at the beginning of the process, how much unencumbered cash do you have? We don't have any unencumbered cash. To now we were presented with documents showing 400 and you know some odd thousand dollars of no we 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 did obligate it between the months of february and june of 2012 we just considered it obligated and this is what we spent it on wow, wow. And, and i guess theoretically the money that's getting paid back then should be used to help offset some of those at that payment schedule uh, whether you put it in the trust fund or, or whatnot, but we don't even know how much is coming back because they're just cashing the checks. And, you know. Yeah, it's, it's not necessarily like, I don't read it as a way that it necessarily has, that money has to come back into the trust fund, but if they're receiving, if that successor agency is receiving paybacks on loans from the previous, then maybe that could be used to offset some of their administrative charges, some of the consultant fees, I, I mean... There, there's lots of other uses for that. It's just, it's just seeing it. It's just getting some financials to be able to see that. So my first crack at this was more philosophical in saying that, well, wait a minute, that wasn't the intent of it, and so why should you be paying back something that you spent the money on you shouldn't have spent it on in the first place? Then shifted more towards the dynamic of, well, wait a minute, we're not even being told what's going on here, and let's even not say, okay, what you did in the past was wrong, we'll even let that go, and as you heard at the city county meeting that we, what we need to focus on is what's that new economic development tool and how do we get this behind us and start working on that. Um, but it takes better communication. We still don't know how much money they're receiving from their obligations. Um, or, they don't know what all the obligations are. No, they won't tell us what's going on. Right. That, that's long and short of it. Oh, Mr. Shad. Sorry I'm late. Um, 
Good job. <laughs> as far as the payback of loans, I received a document yesterday that listed out two loans they've given from the RDAs with the monthly payback amount and the interest length of that loan. Interest rate? Interest rates, monthly payments, how much was loaned. Um, I was trying to listen to the meeting, get here in time. Ms. McClure, you asked about the repayment of those loans and that money. It's my belief that money should come back to the RPTTF fund and be dis dispersed to the taxing entities. They have not been forthcoming with the documentation. Our last oversight board meeting, Supervisor Finnegan asked directly to see that information and it appears that will be on the next oversight board meeting which is scheduled for tomorrow. Which still haven't seen. So what are, what are the two loans? No. Well, I haven't seen the, the documentation. One of the loans was for the old Square Deal building. Yeah. And the other one was for the, I want to say the Hampton Inn or the A Street, the Inn down on A Street on Pill Beach. Yeah, what a, the pool is from a different source. That's from their water fund, not out of redevelopment money? or What they did with the pool is it, the structure exists within the RDA. They didn't have enough money in the RDA to do all the improvements to the pool. So the RDA borrowed funds from the... The RDA borrowed the funds. The RDA borrowed to funds to do from the, the water fund to pay for the wow. pool improvements. Rather than securitizing the own, their own money out of the RDA or going for a bond, which would have required Correct. voter approval. Correct. I know Child Care Council, that building was a... Hartley's. That was an RDA building? Mm -hmm. It didn't show up on the report I got. Report I got. It may have already been paid off. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, it's been, um, I, like I said, I listened to part of the meeting trying to get here in time. It's been frustrating at best. The answers that I receive are, they do change on a daily basis. They change on a meeting basis. Came to our last meeting, was handed some forms that I'd never seen before that changed the numbers again. And on their, on, on their behalf, they're working through it as well. They've hired consultants to come in and work on it. So their answers they're getting are different. Um, they take an approach from the victim, you know, that the state's taking away our money, <clears throat> it's not right, and we're going to fight it. Uh, it translates over, I think, at times 